Stressed over money? Drowning in debt? Credit cards maxed out? Overwhelmed with mounting medical bills? Bad credit? 500refi.com can help you save six, seven, even $800 per month. Even if you've been turned down for credit before, the second chance you've been looking for is 500refi.com. Interest rates are at historic lows. How much can you save with a better mortgage that consolidates your debt, personal loans, car notes, and even your second mortgage into one lower monthly payment? It's free to find out at 500refi.com. This is the MLW Radio Network. Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to What Happened When Monday right here on MLW Radio, and uh, we're doing something fun today, something brand new. If you've enjoyed our Bruce Pritchard show, something to wrestle with here on the MLW Radio Network, I think you're going to enjoy this maybe as much or even more, especially if you enjoy your wrestling a little Southern fried uh, with us today, the man who was there. All the way from Starkid 83 to March 26, 2001, the voice of professional wrestling south of the Mason-Dixon line, Mr. Tony Schiavone himself. Tony, what's going on, man? I'd just like to say, Conrad, this is the greatest podcast in the history of our... Nah, fuck it. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> man, how I'm you looking... doing, buddy? I'm doing great, dude. I-, I can't tell you how excited I am about this. We've had a lot of fun with Bruce going down memory lane for all things WWF. But uh, if you're a real wrestling fan, there's always two sides of the story. And now we get the other side of the story, the Atlanta, the Charlotte, the WCW, the Jim Crockett promotions version. Uh, And you were there pretty much from the beginning, Uh, the rise and the fall, so to speak. So what are you looking forward to or what are you dreading the most about this journey we're about to take? Well, what I'm dreading the most about this journey is that, as you know, uh, it's been many years since we've been doing this. Uh, as since I've been in wrestling, and what I dread most is that uh, people are going to go away from this saying, "Well, he's just an old fuck who can't remember anything." Well, Bruce uh, is that way too, and it's working well, out for him. So I, I know that. I, I always knew that Bruce was a fuck, and now he's an old. <laughs> fuck. But but I always uh, what I, what I always what what concerns me is is that uh, some of these guys that you bring up and some of these angles that you bring up, I'm not going to remember because we did a lot of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. And, and I know a lot of the stuff is documented on, quote, unquote, the dirt sheets. And and I know some of the fans who are close to it remember that. Uh, I want to say this, that Tony Schiavone was not the <laughs> was not the backstage weasel that you thought he was. I, I tried to uh, many times remove myself from all that political stuff that happened. I knew that it happened, and I was kind of like a an observer. <laughs> okay, from afar, uh, and uh, because it, I always thought that the less I knew about it, the less political stuff I and got involved with, the easier my life would be. Uh, but I, you know, I, I saw a lot of stuff happen, and I, and I, uh, I have a lot of opinions on things that happened back then, but. Uh, you know, when you got a lot invested into it like I did, and you're making a great living like I was, uh, you're concerned about the direction that we're going. And sometimes the direction was obviously wrong. And sometimes the direction was, well, you know, okay, let's give it a shot. Why not? Because uh, you, when you're in a, a war b- back in the Nitro days, and when you're in a, in a ratings war or you're in a war to – to gain money, you'll try anything. It's the old thing about throwing things up against the wall, see what sticks. So, Well, you guys threw a lot of shit against the wall, and uh, we're going to talk about something that stuck this week. It's our very first edition of What Happened When Monday. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, and then go ahead and tweet about the show. Spread the word. Spread the love. We're trying to get the word out there uh, that if you grew up a WCW or Jim Crockett Promotions fan, the podcast you've always wanted is finally here. Uh, we're on Twitter at WHW Monday. That's what happened when Monday, just abbreviated it, WHW Monday. He's on Twitter at Tony Shivani 24. I'm on Twitter at Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. We appreciate the follow. We're going to be active on Twitter. And at the end of the show, we're going to let you vote on what you want to hear next week. 
that poll is going to go up and you just need to be following us on Twitter at WHW Monday. And uh, we'll tell you what those poll topics are for next week at the end of the show. But now let's talk about what happened when Bill Goldberg dominated WCW. Uh, And I don't think we could have picked a more timely topic this week, just given the current landscape of professional wrestling. Uh, Goldberg's been on the sidelines for more than a decade now, and now he's back. Uh, returning in Toronto at Survivor Series and, of course, this past weekend at the Royal Rumble. And we all know what happened there, and we're certainly on the road to WrestleMania now. Uh, But we want to talk about why. How can a guy step away after 12 years and come in and be a big player and make a big impact the way he has? What happened when Bill Goldberg dominated WCW? So, Before we get to his debut, which most will remember was September 22nd on Monday Nitro. It was back at Salt Lake City. Uh, Let's kind of set the stage. And uh, you may be familiar with some of this, Tony. I know you grew up. uh, You're actually sporting a Georgia sweatshirt today. And and famously, that's where Goldberg played his college ball before being drafted by the Rams in the 11th round in 90. Uh, And he played there in 90 and then had a brief Canadian Football League stint with the Sacramento Gold Miners. Uh, before finding home with the Atlanta Falcons. He played there from 92 to 94 and then was cut in 95. Uh, The NFL held an expansion draft that year that a lot of football fans will remember for the Jaguars and the Panthers. So the Panthers picked him up, uh, but Bill wouldn't ever actually play for Carolina and famously became, here's a little trivia note for you, the first player ever cut by the Panthers. Um, It's worth mentioning here that he had a pretty severe ab injury that cut his football career short. Uh, so Tony, do you remember him playing football at all, whether it was Georgia or with the Falcons? I don't remember the Falcons. I, I remember uh, Georgia. Uh, I was not a, a big Georgia fan or involved with the school back then, obviously, like, like I am now because I, I was working for WCW, but I remember, uh, that he was a pretty big badass uh, on the Georgia defense on some kind of mediocre teams. Uh, I also remember that Vince Dooley's last game in the Gator Bowl, uh, which I believe was maybe 89, 90, around that era, that Goldberg uh, was unable to play because he was suspended in that game. Wow, I didn't know uh, that. And uh, I don't know what the suspension was about. You know, there, there there's so many so many rules in college football. I don't know if he got in trouble. Sure. I mean, I think that's what it had. He, he got in trouble. What he got in trouble with, I don't know. But, uh, you know, he often used to bring up to me, he used to go, Shivani, let me, can I tell you the time when we played the Florida Gators? And uh, I said, uh, no, Bill, I know all about your football history. I understand. But uh, he was a, he came out of football as a pretty tough son of a bitch. There's a, there's a story. I don't know if you heard this story, Conrad. And I think it's a, it's a pretty darn good story that when he was with the Falcons, he used to challenge the Falcons in the locker room, the players to wrestle. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, uh, th- and somebody was talking to Bill Fralick one time because, you know, Fralick did some things in wrestling. And uh, I, wasn't Fralick in one of the uh, WrestleManias, like WrestleMania 2 or something like that, a part of it? Yeah, he may have, he may have had an involvement there. Right. Uh, he used to challenge guys to wrestle, and someone had said to Fralick, well, you know, you're involved in, you've been involved in wrestling. Uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you wrestle him? And Fralick's response was, not me, that motherfucker's crazy. <laughs> that is so phenomenal. That, that's what that's what type of guy he was. I mean, Goldberg legitimately was a was a guy that was pretty darn tough, and I think that came across on the air. Uh, and uh, you know, he, he he would shake off injuries and shake off bumps and bruises, and uh, just do things that were pretty nuts. And and I think that's why he came across that way. It was pretty legit, at least. It came across to me that way. When did you first hear of Goldberg possibly being interested in pursuing wrestling? Do you recall? Uh, no, I don't recall that. But I, I do recall him being in the power plant. Uh, but uh, but I don't recall when he was first interested in wrestling. Uh, I mean, but- I, I knew who Bill Goldberg was, but it wasn't like, oh, boy, Bill Goldberg is, uh, is this guy who's uh, this big former pro football player wants to get into wrestling. I, I That kind of went past me. But I remember him. I remember when I first saw him at the power plant. Uh, kind of catch everybody up, younger fans who may not be familiar with it. What was the power plant, and uh, kind of remind some guys uh, about who all would have went through there. 
Well, the power plant was a training facility that we had at uh, WCW uh, that was uh, part of our offices uh, out of Atlanta or out of the Atlanta area. It was actually more Marietta. And it was a big warehouse uh, with uh, uh, that was run by Jody Hamilton, uh, the assassin. Uh, and, uh, and I guess he had some trainers to help him out. They had a lot of, um, a lot of rings, uh, a lot of workout equipment. And it was a place where you learned your craft. If you wanted to be a pro wrestler, it was also a place where we could find a talent that basically had it and would become a pretty good wrestler. Years ago, when you wanted to become a pro wrestler, uh, in the old Crockett days, uh, they would they you would call Crockett Promotions and they would contact they would put you in touch with Gene Anderson, right? And Gene Anderson would get like five or ten or twenty guys and bring them to the Charlotte Coliseum before an event and basically run them till they were ready to puke and then beat the shit out of them. Uh, and uh, then uh, if you wanted to come back again, then maybe you had it as a pro wrestler. But that was kind of a weeding out process back then. Because they figure that most of the guys who wanted to be pro wrestlers thought, well, you know, I can do this shit. And then Gene wanted to make sure that you really thought you could or you really could. Uh, and uh, I used to go to some of those and watch guys run up and down the stairs of the Coliseum, up and down the stairs, and Gene screaming at them. And then he'd bring in a wrestler, not necessarily a big name, and then they would beat the shit out of these guys. So that was the forerunner to the to the power plant where this was a, leg uh, a legitimate place and part of our office to bring guys in. And the first time I met Goldberg, he was just kind of, uh, he was laying in the ring on the kind of laying in the ring. They were all kind of lounging. They were taking a break. And I remember thinking, man, this guy is a freaking monster, but he is in person. He is like so laid back. And, and it was, and, and that was one of the remarkable things about uh, Goldberg when I first saw him at the power plant. And then when I first saw him wrestle that he could turn it on. Right. On, like a dime. And and that I think that was one of the more intriguing things about him from from our level. I'm curious. Uh, the power plant was kind of ahead of its time. Of course, now we have a more amped up uh, version of this with NXT for the WWE. But whose idea was the power plant? Would this have been a Bischoff idea? Yeah, it would have been a Bischoff idea. I think it was. I think it was maybe uh, maybe there was discussion about it before Eric came along, but I think it was really Bischoff's idea. And if, if you think about it, you say it was ahead of its time. Yeah, it was ahead of its time because look at it this way: you've got three hours of Nitro, you got two hours of Thunder, you got WCW Saturday Night, and pretty soon fans are going to have seen just about everybody. Ole right. Anderson used to say, "You're going to see so we're throwing out so many combinations that pretty good that pretty soon." Uh, fans will have seen all of our shit. And that's true. So they had to find new talent and, and new ways. In the old days, you just, they went from territory to territory and you would see Baron Von Raschke in the AWA and all of a sudden he showed up in, in Crockett Promotions and you'd heard about him and read about him and he was a seasoned veteran who you had not seen. Right. They could keep things fresh back then. So in an effort to keep things fresh, they had the power plant to train guys. Uh, and I, and I thought, uh, I thought they did some pretty good work out there. I really did. Before Goldberg gets signed to go train at the power plant, he mentioned that he was at least in preliminary negotiations with the WWF. Did you ever hear about that? I did not hear about that, but, uh, if I'm a wrestler, uh, I'm going to use that bullshit line too. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm not, uh, mad at that. not, not to uh, say it was bullshit, but why not? Right. Why not? In negotiation. Yeah. Uh, so once he finishes up at the uh, power plant, he starts doing some dark matches uh, for before he makes his television debut. He had five that we could run down. Uh, he wrestled as Bill Gold. His first match was a dark match on June 23rd. This is 1997. Uh, it's before Nitro, and he wrestled his power plant trainer, Sergeant Buddy Lee Parker. Uh, then he has another dark match uh, before a Saturday night episode. Uh, there he wrestles Buddy Landell. Of course, we're seeing this with... Some really seasoned veterans here. Uh, then he goes on to wrestle Hugh Morris at a house show. Uh, and he has another dark match against Chip Minton. And then John Betcha at a house show. So on June 24th, uh, he wrestles his uh, final final dark match uh, at a Saturday night taping. Fortune. Did you see any of these dark matches? 
No, Any I did not. I didn't watch dark matches. I just, I didn't. Wow, well, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, you know, they just, uh, you know, we did uh, we did matches and we did shows and we just uh, kind of walked away from all that after that. I, I didn't really watch them. Well, I mean, there's not a reason for a television commentator to watch something that's not on television. I get it. it makes right, sense. Right, right. Yeah, I was, you know, I was. Well, we did a lot of shit back then, and I was kind of, I don't know. Uh, in the middle I, of all of it. Yeah, you know, it's hard to say that I was tired because I was just sitting on my ass talking. So I wasn't tired. I was just tired of wrestling. It's, it's, yeah, it's kind of like what I'm doing baseball now. You know, I do minor league baseball and I get pretty thrilled about it around this time when you get into March and, and spring training starts in the middle of February. And then August, uh, April 1st starts and you're really pumped about it. But by the middle of August, I don't want to see another fucking baseball game. Uh, <laughs> and that's kind of the way I was with dark matches. We had seen so much stuff. I mean, you live this stuff and, and you, you voice over matches, uh, you know, in the studio on WCW Saturday night and worldwide. And you do things live. You just if, if it ain't on TV, you don't want to see it. Uh, so let's get to the main event. What we're really here to talk about. We're going to talk about bookends for Mr. Goldberg. The start in oh. the end, uh, September 22nd, 1997. We finally see Goldberg make his television debut. I think most everybody listening to this has seen this. He beats Hugh Morris uh, mm-hmm. in two minutes and 24 seconds. Uh, it's the same move he recently used uh, to beat Brock Lesnar, the jackhammer. Uh, before we talk about the match, uh, what did you think of the jackhammer as a finisher, Tony? I guess it's a suplex slam. I thought it was tremendous. I, I thought that Goldberg became a guy who got over because of a finishing move and not necessarily a guy who could talk. Right. Conrad, the guys in the business, uh, I always thought that the way to get over in the business, well, you got to be a, you got to be a good wrestler, but you got to be able to talk and you got to be able to talk to the fans and you got to be able to say something they like. And that's, you know, that must have been the hallmark of Dusty, of Flair, of Stone Cold Steve Austin, of The Rock, all the big stars, of Hogan. Uh, they could talk, and they would say things that you would you know, identify with. Goldberg didn't do that. Goldberg just had this finishing move that everybody went, holy shit, that thing was great, and that's why he got over. Uh, and one of the reasons he got over. But, right. uh, but I, I thought the jackhammer was sensational. Uh, nobody uh, had been doing it uh, that I could remember, uh, and it looked legit. Uh, and it uh, kind of uh, helped his persona of being a, what fans have perceived and what really was a legitimate badass. Is this what you think Hugh Morris is most known for? Uh, Bill DeMott, of course, would go on to be a trainer at NXT and do a lot of other stuff in WCW and the WWF. And, you know, he, he was a crash and the Terminator. I mean, he did a lot of stuff. But yeah. being Goldberg's first television match is probably what he's going to be most known for. Would you agree with that? I uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, no, I thought Bill DeMott could do a lot of great things. But in, as far as the fans are concerned, I, I would agree with that. But, yeah. but no, I, I thought Hugh Morris was, uh, was Phenomenal a good talent. performer. Oh, absolutely. To be able to yeah. do a moonsault at that size is impressive. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Very agile for being a big guy. Uh, so let's go to the September 29th edition of The Observer. Dave Meltzer had this to say about Goldberg's debut. Rookie Bill Goldberg mm-hmm. pinned Hugh Morris in two minutes and 24 seconds after a suplex. After kicking out of the moonsault, Goldberg, who looked very much like the warlord, slightly gassed down, not like this guy didn't look gassed up, was Mm -hmm. a football player in the Falcons camp a few years back who they've been high on for a few months, and he's done some worldwide and dark match tryouts. Goldberg wound up with a black eye out of the match. He definitely has potential because he was pretty mobile for a big guy, and obviously he was green. Gene Okerlund tried to interview Goldberg, who walked off. The gimmick they're trying to do is he's a mystery guy. And nobody knows uh, anything about him. So, Tony, you called this match. Uh, yes. what, what are your memories of the television debut? And did you know right then they have some serious plans for this guy? Uh, I knew right then that this guy had some serious ability. But did I think they had serious plans for him? Uh, no. I, and let me tell you why, Conrad, because... That was one of the biggest clusterfucks that I ever announced in my life. <laughs> and the reason I say that is I remember it. Uh, I remember 
And I'm not so sure who the booker was back then. You may know who the booker was back then. Uh, uh, well, I think Bischoff had a committee, but I know Sullivan was yeah. involved. I know Bischoff yeah. was involved. Right. I think right. 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 Graham and, was and, around. Right. I remember when I was told that Bill Goldberg was going to debut that. And I and I said, you know, there there obviously was a plan to put him on TV, but there was not about a, a plan as to what they were going to do with him. And the reason I say that is because I had asked Eric or maybe Kevin or maybe maybe Terry Taylor. I'm just throwing out names. I may be wrong. Right. Somebody in the booking committee. I asked, what are we going to call him? And they said, we'll get back to you. They never got back to me on what they're going to call him. And I remember he came out and I remember talking to whoever the producer was. We had producers in the truck and producers at the gorilla position. Uh, and uh, I remember pushing the button down and say, hey, guys, he's walking out. What do I call him? Do I call him Goldberg? Do I call him Bill Goldberg? Do you have a catch name for him like Stone Cold Bill Goldberg? You know, just to, to use a catch name. No one got back to me. And I said, all right, we're on the air. What the fuck do I say? And uh, I think Bischoff finally said, just go ahead and say Goldberg. And that told me that they were either not prepared to uh, introduce him as a character or they just didn't know what the fuck they were doing. Um, wow. So I, if you listen to that match, and I have not watched the match since then, uh, you may find out that I didn't say his name for a little while because I was not told what to say. So that was his debut with the booking committee either too busy or forgetting to tell me or I, I don't know what the reason. But I, I, I remember that because I remember saying we got this guy we want to promote as a big star and we have no idea what to call him. So this is a time where I tell you to hit pause on the podcast right now. And uh, go hit the subscribe button and then tweet uh, at our show at WHW Monday. This is the greatest podcast in the history of our sport. Nowhere else are you going to get nuggets <laughs> like that. Uh, so you made the joke there. Uh, Goldberg did have a similar look to Steve Austin, who was obviously catching fire in the WWF on another channel. Uh, both have a shaved head. Both had the goatee. Both had black tights and knee pads and boots. Um, Austin had been there once before, but now he's really caught fire uh, up north. And there's been a lot of debate about this over the years. Do you know, can you set the record straight? Was it by design to have Goldberg look basically like Austin? Or is it just a coincidence how it played out as far as and you know? I think it was just a coincidence. That, that's the way Goldberg looked. Right. Yeah, I, I think it was just a coincidence. I, You know, Steve... Steve Austin was was more than just a look. It was the way he would talk and, sure. and the, his character and everything. Uh, so I, I think the look was just a coincidence. Well, and that's what I think. You know, I, I know we call this uh, "What Happened When?" W H W Monday, right? Mm -hmm. Back then, when I was calling the Goldberg match for the first time, it was uh, W T F Monday. <laughs> Yeah. Because I didn't know what the fuck to say. Uh, and, you know, and, and I was and, and that really I, I didn't I let a lot of things roll off my back that worked and didn't work. And, and a lot of confusion that went backstage. And uh, but that to me kind of bugged me because I, I had a, I knew that this guy had a chance to be something. Sure. And it seemed to me that we didn't have a plan for him. If they if they did have a plan for him and they may have Conrad, they didn't tell me. Only thing I needed was a name. And I think the match kind of spoke for itself. Uh, but uh, that that that's one of those that will stick in my memory to the point to where I even remember that we were in Salt Lake City for that. So, I mean, we did so many matches, and they'll say, where were you at that time? I said, I don't know. We did so many cities. But I remember Salt Lake City, and I remember the Goldberg match, and I remember thinking, wow, here he is, and what are we doing? And, and I say that because, you know, I worked for Vince for a year. Right. And that, that seemed to me at the, back then – and that one year, I worked for Vince. And, of course, I came from the Crockett Promotions, which was a family-run, small-time, trying-to-be-big organization, to this big uh, wrestling machine up in the Northeast. When I worked there, 
it was pretty organized. Right. And they, they had their shit together. And now I come down here, and of course this is many, many years later, I come uh, to WCW, and they got a guy that they're going to try to hang their hat on, or at least one of their big stars from the power plant, and they don't have a clue, and it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I don't know if rubbed me the wrong way is the right word, but it kind of it's irritating. It stuck with me, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, of course, this win over Hugh Morris would be the first of many in a row for Goldberg, uh, allegedly up to 173, but we'll talk about that. Uh, mm-hmm. After this debut, he starts working house shows on the loop with Hugh Morris, Roadblock, and Barbarian. Uh, and when discussing the September 29th Nitro, the very next week, Meltzer wrote, Bill Goldberg got a second upset over Barbarian with a suplex slam, which we know now is the jackhammer, in three minutes and nine seconds. They said Goldberg was a uh, former all-SEC defensive lineman at the University of Georgia from 86 to 89 and played with the Falcons. Barbarian seemed visibly less than pleased having to put over Goldberg. Uh, Goldberg has potential in his size, uh, but this was bad. Tony, do you remember having Barbarian or, or guys having a problem putting Bill over early in his career like this in this really quick fashion, or is this something Meltzer is just making something out of nothing? Well, I, I, let, let me, I, I'm sure some of them did, Conrad, because you know they all had egos. They wanted to do uh, – everybody wanted to be pushed. Right. If you weren't, if you weren't getting the push – that you thought you would could you you're thinking that you know, it's going to hurt my bottom line, but uh, go back to this line that Meltzer wrote uh, that he seemed to be upset about yeah. putting him over right yeah he seemed, how how can how can you uh, how do you seem upset what line is that I mean, what <laughs> you know how do, how do, how does he how can you tell by watching TV that he seemed barbarian was and still is and I saw him at the fan fest. He was one of the he's one of the great guys in wrestling. Right, so just a great man, and, and just uh, always happy seemingly. And I, I can no, I don't think he was that way. I mean, I would think I have to go back and look at the match. Maybe if I look at the match, maybe I agree with Meltzer that yeah, he was. But I don't know how you can come up with a comment like that unless you're trying to stir up shit. Well, there you which go. Which could have been that, you know. You and Bruce are going to get along just fine. Uh, on, the, on the October 20th Observer, uh, Dave wrote, Bill Goldberg pinned Scotty Riggs after a suplex in two minutes and 34 seconds. Goldberg showed a ton of potential. So everybody's seeing this by late mm-hmm. October. Uh, do you remember, Tony, a match or a moment where you thought to yourself, man, this guy could be a big deal? Yeah, I can't remember, Matt. The only thing I can remember on the moment is that the, the jackhammer looked legit. Yeah. I can't really go back and, and point to a match and say, wow, he is it. I, I just think that that every uh, every jackhammer looked legit. I think every guy who took the jackhammer did a hell of a job that I can remember, and I'm sure some didn't, that I can remember uh, made it look legit. I don't – was there anybody that you remember, Conrad, that – and this is, a, this is a great way to get fired. After you took the jackhammer – one, two, three, and after the three count, they would try to kick out. Oh, yeah. I yeah, I don't remember any guy trying to do that, but if they did, I'm sure they weren't around much, you know, much longer. I think, uh, I think, uh, Kurt did that once. I think Kurt, Kurt did. did that. I, I think, I mean, I could be, I could be wrong. I'm sure Twitter will correct us. Yeah. Well, that, that's just Kurt trying to fuck around. That's all that sure. was. From yeah. the same observer, uh, Dave wrote, Ming will face Bill Goldberg at World War Three. This is supposed to be a big deal because Goldberg does a shoot fighting gimmick and Ming is supposed to be one of the toughest men in the world. Of course, since the fans see Ming as a mid-card guy who's been around forever and nobody cares a lick about him and because the announcers are either afraid to talk about or not allowed to talk about or simply don't know anything about shoot shoot fighting to talk about it, Goldberg has this unspoken gimmick, which means nobody at home understands the significance of either guy, let alone the match. Don Fry said he was given an offer by WCW, but wants to finish his New Japan commitments first, since they gave him his first break and asked him not to start WCW just yet. New Japan has positioned him as a shooter, and if he starts bouncing off the ropes and doing jobs like Ken Shamrock, his value in Japan will drop. So, Tony, I want you to set the record straight here. Do you recall ever being given a directive that Goldberg was supposed to look like a shoot fighter, and were you ever told not to talk about shoot fighting? Uh, no, I was never told not to talk about shoot fighting because with the exception of Dave Meltzer uh, and the people who read his magazine and the shoot fighting fans, I don't think we gave a fuck about it. Uh, we didn't. Why, why would we? Right. No, I agree. Uh, uh, 
so I, I don't uh, no, I don't I don't want afraid that uh, that was that's funny. Uh, we just know we don't who you know if I, I can tell you that that Ming and, and Melter's right about this uh, was perceived as kind of a mid card guy right by the fans and was legitimately one of the baddest asses ever right. Um, but in that same vein, he was one of the just like the barbarian, one of the great guys ever. Uh, we all like. We all thought that uh, if we ever wanted somebody, uh, I put it this way. I remember thinking, and I would tell some of the the announcers as some of the guys says, if I ever take over this damn business, Ming's going to be with me everywhere I go. And when I negotiate <laughs> a damn contract, he's going to be sitting in the fucking corner and just sit uh, because he was just legitimately a badass. Uh, he's right about that. But as far as shoot fighting is concerned, you know, I, we're, pro, we're promoting our own product. Why should we even talk about shoot fighters? Who, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, who gives a shit? Do you remember uh, WCW ever talking about bringing in Don Fry, or is that just rumor and innuendo? I don't remember that. Uh, do you have any crazy Ming stories? I mean, every, yes, I can, you, yeah. can you give us one? This is a, this is a legendary Ming story. Uh, Heenan told the story better than I did. Uh, but, and I, I was there that night. I believe I was there that night. Cause I know there's a lot of commotion. I heard the story later. Uh, Ming, when he would, as a lot of guys would, when he get a little few in him, would get, you know, would, would get, uh, happy and would get tougher and would get, would not take any bullshit. Legend has it that at a bar one night, Ming there was a guy next to him uh, ripping on the fact that wrestling was fake and all the guys were full of shit. And Ming did not have anything to say, just sat there. And the guy was still talking about how fake it was. Ming walked over to him, put his two fingers in the guy's mouth and broke off his bottom teeth. Oh, God. Wow. Uh, the, the reason I thought of the uh, reason I, I think I was there that night was there was a lot of commotion at the bar one night when Ming was there and I was there. So I think I was around for that. But yeah, just you know, the guys, pow, broke off. He pulled his bottom teeth. Uh, and that's that's another Ming story I have is 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 not too graphic, but it's 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 a we were going to. We were on our way into to Universal Studios to do our taping. We had a place to park, and I parked my, my rental car, and I saw Ming, and we walked in together. And I loved talking to him because he was such a great guy. And he said, uh, you've got children, and, and I have five children. They were younger at that time. And he said, uh, how's things at your house? How do you handle these these the, your children? I said, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I just try to be the best father again. He said, my son doesn't do anything I say. He just, he just won't do anything I say. I said, let your son know who the fuck you are. (laughs) You know, I mean, Tony Schiavone telling his son Matt to do something is different than Ming telling his son to do something. Yeah, it is. Okay. Because, I mean, I would say, you know, son, I, I broke out a guy's bottom teeth at the bar one night. You know, I will stick your head up your ass. <laughs> so I think his son was dead. So we had a big laugh about that. And and I always remember that when Ming had come to me for fatherly advice. And I had I had told him to remind his son who in the fuck he was because he was a badass. Absolutely. But but, but Meltzer's right that, uh, that that was more kind of, I guess, the impression that we had of Ming in the back. And we knew who he was. Than the fans, uh, him being a mid card guy, but that's, you know, I I thought his run as King Haku and all of that stuff in the WWE was pretty good. Absolutely, it was. From the October twenty seventh Observer, Davis recapping a Nitro again. He says Goldberg, who got a noticeable pop, tackled and suplexed Wrath for the pin in only twenty seconds. Don't think mm-hmm. for a second that Goldberg doing the gimmick where he walks to the ring like Shamrock with gloves like Shamrock that WCW isn't doing an in-your-face gimmick and that they are taking somebody with no name and creating their own shamrock. Meanwhile, WWF had the real thing and turned him into just another pro wrestler. Mm -hmm. Tony, do you remember there being any sort of talk internally about shamrock and thinking, 
in WCW kind of thinking, we need a guy like this? Or is this, again, just Meltzer? I uh, I think I, Meltzer's probably right on here with, with that, uh, that the look and the gloves and everything were, were similar. Um you know, there was all there was awful lot, just like there is in pro sports now. When when somebody does something, and you see it, when a team does something and and, and they see it, you'll see other teams do it as well. It kind of catches on. So I, they they obviously knew what was both sides knew what was going on, and and I, and I think there may be a lot of validity to that. Uh, on the on the Observer on November third, uh, he's recapping a Nitro, talking about Alex Wright wrestling Steve McMichael, and he references that Goldberg did a run in, doing his jackhammer on McMichael while Deborah distracted the referee, uh, mm. and then Wright drops on top of Steve for the pin. So, um, the the angle here, which I, I've always kind of been fascinated with, WCW's obsession with this. Is uh, after the match, Deborah gives Goldberg Steve's 1985 Super Bowl ring from the Chicago Bears, uh, mm-hmm. and as Alex Wright goes to thank Goldberg, he decks Alex and gives him a jackhammer as well, and mm-hmm. it got negative a star and a half, which is fun. Mm-hmm. Um, do you remember this segment about a Super Bowl ring? And, and I want you to just kind of let's do a detour here and talk about WCW and their obsession with fucking rings. It feels like Battle Bowl rings, Super Bowl rings. If there's a ring, WCW wants to find a way to make an angle out of this. Who loved this concept so much? Well, I remember that that Dusty loved the ring concept. I remember him saying that, uh, you know, that what was important to athletes and what was a big deal was a ring. Right. I remember him saying that. Uh, and uh, Super Bowl rings, World Series rings, whatever. And I guess that kind of caught on and stayed. You know, I mean, years ago they used to. I remember you used to go to the Roanoke Civic Center and they would wrestle for a brand new Cadillac. Uh, so they always try to think of something different to right. wrestle for. Sure. Uh, so yeah, let me say this. Uh, when you were talking about Deborah, the yeah. uh, only thing I could think about when you're talking about Deborah was Deborah. Uh, is she your favorite and, thing to come out of Tuscaloosa? I love her. Uh, well, actually, I still stay in contact with her. Uh, I think she – did she get her master's at Alabama? I don't know. I, yeah, I think she did. I think she got her master's degree at Alabama, and I still – oh, my God. I had lunch with her uh, one day in, in Tuscaloosa – I mean um, in uh, in Birmingham, and then we played a basketball game in Tuscaloosa, and her and her friends came out. I got her tickets, had uh, dinner with her afterwards, and we talked just <sighs> – I'm just, you're talking about a ring and I'm talking about her, her boobs. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. I, 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 roll, thank you. Roll Tide. <laughs> uh, she was just, I mean, Deborah, Deborah McMichael was a legitimately sweet lady who looked like a million bucks. Um, and we became very friendly. And, uh, I mean, not in the biblical sense, things like that. But, uh, <laughs> We became very friendly, and I just loved her. And now you're talking about her, and you're talking about Alex Wright getting jackhammered. You're talking about a, a star and a half match, and I'm just thinking about the way she looked. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, I'm just, a, I'm just as as the girls at Starbucks says that you're just an old creep. Well, you, uh, once upon a time, you were a young creep. Yes, I was <laughs> middle aged creep back then. There you go. Uh, but yeah, wow. So, uh, thank, you for bring, thank you for bringing her up. Yeah, it looks like I brought some other stuff up, too. In mid-November, uh, <laughs> Meltzer reported that WCW was going to do— I'd give, the match, I'd give the match five stars just because she was in the camera angle, camera <laughs> shot. Okay? That's five stars. Okay, yeah, There you go. All right. Uh, I had never heard this before. I want you to shoot this down or co-sign this. Uh, oh, Melt- oh Meltzer says that WCW was considering doing a tough man division with the likes of Chris Benoit, Fit Finley, Bill Goldberg, mm-hmm. Mongo yeah. McMichael, Ming, and others, and supposedly even include a world title for this division. Do you remember this being discussed? Yeah, I do remember this being discussed. Uh, and just been, I, and again, I think it got kind of lost in the because we had or they had so much to do. It kind of got lost in the shuffle of it, that. It's weird because how, if you if you have a t- again, uh, Conrad, if you have a freaking tough man division, you're going to eventually run out of tough men. And 
I always thought that we had so many divisions. I understand we had a cruiserweight division, uh, which was a kind of offshoot of the junior heavyweight championship or whatever it was. You you have all these different titles. To me, and I know this is old school, it makes your world champion uh, less than a world champion. So let me ask you this. When we're saying tough man division, around this same time or the next year, actually, the next summer, the WWF would introduce Brawl for All, which is universally panned as one of their worst fucking ideas ever. This tough man division, was this supposed to be worked or would this be a shoot? No, it was going to be a work. Everything we did was a work, Conrad. Well, not Brawl for All, which is still the dumbest idea maybe in the history of pro wrestling. But we'll we'll challenge that okay. later, I'm I sure. I want to tell you how dumb Brawl for All was. Okay? Okay. I've completely forgotten about it. <laughs> That's how freaking dumb it was. If you'll say, if you'll ask, say, Shivani, uh, tell us about Brawl for All. I say, I don't even know where in the hell it was. That's great. Okay. And and that, I'm telling you that 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 sometimes is a barometer. If if, if there's something really shitty, uh, you block it out. And you have a lot of shitty stuff, you don't remember it. But if there's something really good, you remember it. And then again, if there's something really 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 bad, you remember it. But that was kind of like, uh, kind of all in the middle there. Uh, during November, Goldberg starts working house show matches with Bobby Eaton. Uh, Tony, I think we'd probably agree here. If we were booking a green guy that we wanted to push, uh, doesn't it make sense to book him with a talent like Bobby Eaton? No question. Bobby Eaton was one of the great workers, and uh, Bobby was also one of the one of the guys who would would do anything. You know, Bobby Eaton took bumps for me, too. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, I, I agree. Wait, with that. He, in the ring or off a fingernail? <laughs> we, when I was, uh, I used to be the, uh, for a stretch, I was the, uh, I was the, uh, ring announcer at the Omni and sometimes, uh, Bobby would, you know, they would throw him down right to where I was and we would, and, and you know, he would kind of come over to us and we would stand up, me and Charlie McGowan would stay, who was a uh, ring that would ring the bell, would stand up and Bobby would push me. And then he would say, push me back. And I would push him and he would take a bump for me. Uh, that's the type of guy Bobby Eaton was. You know, he was just there to, he was there for the entertainment value. He was a tremendous worker. Uh, and he, you know, he kind of, he, he was, he was there for the business. So Absolutely. he took bumps for me. There you go. I can tell you right now, if I would ever push Jim Cornette, he wouldn't have taken a bump for me. <laughs> He'd have hit me in the head with his racket. He would have, but Bobby used to take, but we, we did that a lot at the, at the Omni through the years. So by the end of November, uh, Meltzer notes that Goldberg is already starting to move quarter hours, giving him a plus 10 rating with only nine guys finishing ahead of him. Some of those names being Ric Flair, Roddy Piper, Steve Austin, and Ray Mysterio. Uh, Tony, I'm curious, when do you remember quarter hours being discussed? When did that become a thing for WCW? Uh, I think they became a thing for WCW just about the time that we started going on the air a little bit earlier, if you'll recall, uh -huh. instead of, uh, five, five minutes before. The discussion was that we needed to be doing something hot or something that the fans wanted to see at every quarter hour. In other words, don't be in a break. Have something good every quarter hour because that's when right then – at eight fifteen zero 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 is when they take the ratings sh uh, sample. So I remember that being discussed, and it was very important that we had things at the quarter hour. And I think that also led to us being uh, very uh, uh, confused is not the word here, Conrad, but we did a lot of changes on the fly. Right. Uh, and I think that was because they would go back and they would they would – uh, lay out this big nitro, and then they would watch things happen. They would look at the quarter hours and thinking, uh-oh, this is not going according to plan. We need to change things up, and they would change things up as we were going on. Uh, so I, I remember, that's what I remember about the quarter hours, them saying, we've got to have it at 15, at 30, at 45, top of the hour, we've got to be doing something. Uh, that's why, well, they wanted to start the show a little bit before Vince, but they also wanted to make sure at the top of the hour that they weren't in the, the open that they wanted to be wrestling. That was the, the thought back then. I like it. Um, Goldberg was supposed to wrestle Mongo here at World War Three. So Ming was out. They had kind of uh, shelved that idea. And now it's supposed to be Mongo in November. But Goldberg has to pull out due to a groin injury. So they start doing uh, feuds with pull-aparts, backstage angles, and so forth. 
uh, to kind of work around the fact that Goldberg is injured, uh, including a deal where on the December 15th Nitro, uh, J.J. Dillon orders Goldberg to take a match with Ming, which gets a pop, uh, but then Mongo attacks Goldberg, causing a pull-apart. Uh, so ultimately, this Mongo-Goldberg match that was supposed to happen before actually happens at Starcade 97. So that's where you'll see Goldberg's pay-per-view debut, uh, the biggest pay-per-view in the history of WCW at that time, Starcade mm-hmm. 97. And it wins the Observer's worst match poll for the pay-per-view. Yeah. And uh, Meltzer's breakdown is just too fun to skip. Here it is. Okay. Bill Goldberg pins Steve McMichael in 5 minutes and 59 seconds. They started brawling in the aisle. Unfortunately, they wound up in the ring. There was no heat at all because it was deaf, dumb, and blind leading the blind. It ended up with a spot where Goldberg punched McMichael, who fell through a table set up at ringside. There Mm -hmm. was a small ECW champ, but I'm not sure if it was in mocking it, uh, since it was the weakest table-breaking spot in history. McMichael got back in the ring, selling his back. He tried his tombstone pile driver, but he couldn't hold Goldberg, who then finished McMichael with the jackhammer. Hideous minus one star. Okay. Uh, so, Tony, I understand the football aspect of having a yeah. falcon take on a bear, but is it right. really wise to book two green guys like this in your biggest pay per view in all time? Who booked this shit? Uh, the the committee did. I I, I agree. It's it, it's not a good idea. Uh, but but the. I guess the opposite thing is uh, if you want to put Goldberg on your biggest pay-per-view, who do you put him with? Right. And, and again, it gets back to the fact of you got so many combinations, you run out of combinations so far. Uh, I'm sure that Goldberg and and McMichael worked on this match at the power plant. I would hope they did. Uh, but uh, it's hard to tell. You know, th- that, uh, that, that piques my interest. I want to go back and watch that match. I think uh, you're the only one. Uh, no, I do. I do. I do want to go back and watch that match because I just want to see how bad it was. You know, I, I look at uh, I've not watched much wrestling. I'll be honest with you since since I left. But the, what I have watched, uh, I rem- and I can't I can't name a match. But what I have watched, I look at that and go, oh, that's bullshit. Uh, so uh, basically on the uh, bullshit uh, meter, uh, that was probably uh, that Meltzer may be right to me. That match would reek of, of being a bad one, yeah. only because the guys are green. So Goldberg starts working house show matches with uh, the likes of Barry Horowitz, Renegade, and Glacier around this time. Many of these matches finishing in under 10 seconds. I can't wait to talk about Renegade with you. We'll do it another time. But speaking of stupid fucking ideas. Well, well, can I say this about Renegade? Yes, sir. He's dead, right? Yes, sir. Yes, he is. So then we can talk shit about him. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. Okay. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, Where were we? I'm sorry. I was thinking about ripping Michael again. Go ahead. Glacier. uh, I want to know about this horse shit. It's a little over a year old here, and supposedly WCW invests all kinds of money and time in this debacle for the silly snow effect and the lasers and just the whole presentation. And now here we are roughly a year after it and we're, we're squashing it in 10 seconds. I need to hear the way this shit was pitched to you the first time. Do you remember this whole glacier debacle? Well, I, I remember, uh, I remember the, uh, the teasers. That's how it started. Yeah. And the teasers were pretty awesome. And I remember, and I remember, uh, what I remember about it is Eric, saying basically that uh, Mortal Kombat and his kids were into Mortal Kombat in the video game. And and, and I guess this guy Glacier was kind of like a, a rip off of that or an offshoot of that. Uh, one of the Mortal Kombat guys. And he thought they could get the kids with it. But I knew uh, I knew that. Uh, Conrad, I knew I think we all knew that there was no way that anybody could follow up all this hype. It was impossible. It was one of those overhyped things that unless he was, it was just, it was impossible to do it. I mean, I I knew just by all this buildup we had blood was blood runs cold. Was that one of the things? That's right. How about that? Jogging my old man memory. Um, I, I just knew there was no way that this guy, uh, and good guy, uh, would be able to, uh, it would be a popcorn fart. 
Yeah, I, I don't think. I, I, let me be clear there. I'm not disparaging the person who played the character. Just no. the gimmick was the shits. Yeah, the gimmick was the shits because it was, it was, it was too well done. Well, there's one way of putting it. The first Nitro of '98 was from the Georgia yeah, it was, Dome. It was. It was too well done. It was. It was a gimmick that had these vignettes and it had the, all these teasers that you couldn't live up to. You could not live up to. Absolutely. Now, now, compare that to Goldberg. No teasers, no build up. It was just what happened in the ring and put him over. No teasers. Hell, we don't even know his fucking name. Even the announcers <laughs> don't. <laughs> Uh, the first, Damn right we didn't. the first Nitro of 98 is at the Georgia Dome and it sets a lot of records and it features the tremendous in-ring confrontation that people wanted to see from a debuting Bret Hart and Ric Flair. And this is right after Bret's arrival. Uh, and on this show on the undercard, uh, Goldberg pins Stevie Ray from the Harlem heat in under three minutes. Uh, now we get to something you probably didn't think you'd hear the next week. Nitro was a little different. Meltzer wrote, the opener was a great UWF style match as Bill Goldberg beat Jerry Flynn in a minute 24. Apparently the day before at the worldwide tapings, these two did what was supposed to be an easy squash and the bout was so hot. They decided to put it on nitro and what aired was basically a duplicate of that match. Mm. Flynn has worked with the PWFG in Japan and actually did the world combat championship shoot show, losing his only match. So he knows how to work a UWF style since Goldberg is so over They can do this style and get big pops doing it. Tony, did you hear about this Jerry Flynn match at Worldwide? Do you remember that? I don't remember it at all. No. Does this sound like an idea that Eric Bischoff would be high on, given his martial arts background? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, Goldberg starts racking. And to me, it was kind of like shoot fighting. right? Right. I didn't give a shit about shoot fighting. I didn't give a shit about martial arts, so... Neither one of them got over with me, but that's just my thing. Well, we're all tied. Yeah. Uh, Goldberg starts racking up wins after this in a big way, uh, taking on the likes of Kendall William, uh, Kendall Wyndham, uh, Ming, Brad Armstrong, Buddy Lee Parker, Eugene Nagata, Mark Starr, Dave Finley, Rick Fuller, Sick Boy, Barry Darso, Vincent Lodi, Wayne Bloom, Rocco Rock, Van <laughs> Hammer, Mike Enos, Scott Norton, and Jim <laughs> Powers. The list goes on and on. My God. Um, from the February 9th Observer, uh, Dave wrote, Goldberg destroyed Mark Starr in a minute 12 with the jackhammer to the same big pop as always. Mm-hmm. Whenever I see Goldberg, I can only think how lucky we are in this day and age to have supplements like creatine so all the wrestlers yeah. don't have to see a guy like Goldberg getting a push based on nothing but a look and start gobbling up steroids like everyone 14 years ago did when Nikita Koloff came in and got the exact same reaction looking mm-hmm. almost exactly the same with the same push. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk about Nikita a lot on another show, but I want to touch on steroids and creatine here. Back in 97, 98, we started hearing a lot about this, uh, and it really cranked up when Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire got hot in baseball, setting all the home run records. Do you yeah. remember the boys talking about creatine and that being a thing? No, I don't. And I, I you know, I didn't go, I didn't go in the, in the we had our own room. Right. In our own locker room. So I didn't go in the locker room and really hang out with them that much. But I mean, Conrad, it was pretty apparent. I mean, that it was that it was there. Uh, and I guess uh, what happened with Sosa and McGuire began the testing stage of wrestling. Uh, but uh, I don't remember talk about that. But I think it was pretty apparent that that happened. And that's just, you know, that's that's Meltzer trying to be irreverent. Uh, in, in early February, uh, he reports that Ming wrestled Goldberg at a WCW Saturday night taping and Goldberg blew up after six minutes into the match and couldn't do his jackhammer right and ended up yep. accidentally dropping Ming on his head. Right. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about the mule kick to Bret Hart some other time, but do you remember Goldberg having a reputation as being dangerous and guys not wanting to work with him when he was kind of young in his career here? Yeah, I, I remember that. I, I remember that uh, discussion was the, in the back that you know that you know he could hurt you because he's green. He's getting this big push, and because he legitimately gets pretty fired up about what's going on. Uh, you know, and, and when the when the when the bell rings, uh, for some reason I do remember uh, Bill kind of blowing up and us thinking, you know, this match has gone too long for him. Right. You know, you you, you can get blow you can blow up two ways you can it can go a little bit longer 
than you think it or go a little bit longer than you're used to. And thus physically you're blown up, but mentally and emotionally you get blown up too. Cause you get so fired up. Right. Uh, so I, I think, uh, we probably saw a couple of instances of that with Goldberg. Um, he was blown up. Let's talk about the match. A lot of people are probably tuning in to hear us talk about it's Goldberg and Steve Regal. Uh, this match happened on nitro. And, uh, of course it ends like the rest of them after five minutes with a jackhammer, uh, Meltzer wrote, simply put, it doesn't matter the opponent. Goldberg's matches have to be 90 seconds. He was totally exposed here, and everyone in the crowd was uh, before their very eyes. Uh, there was some heat on Regal because they thought he was kind of exposing him, since Regal is a legitimate shooter as opposed to a paper shooter. But Regal was just doing a wrestling match, and Goldberg only has his three spots and his quick burst of intensity uh, and is lost doing anything else. Do you remember this specific match and the heat on Regal after there were rumors coming out of the taping that he was fired that day, but it would take about a month before they uh, fired him and Meltzer would then still blame this match as the reason his 90 day rollover wouldn't be renewed. I, I, I do remember something about that. Uh, and, uh, I do know that Regal pride himself as, as a shooter and, uh, and a legit, uh, wrestler. Uh, but, uh, whether that whether that led to it or not, I don't know. You know, uh, back then, uh, Meltzer talked to a lot of the boys, so he probably I, I would think that that was that was probably legit. Uh, Goldberg would defeat Brad Armstrong in around two minutes at Super Brawl Eight, and what Meltzer mm-hmm. gave one star in the description, it was what it needed to be. Yeah, he's right about that. Uh, right. The Atlanta Journal Constitution, which is one of the biggest papers in the South and was even bigger in 97, 98. It used to be a big paper. It's it's a piece of crap now, but go ahead. In 98, it had a huge distribution, though, did it not? Sure did. Sure did. Uh, They ran a positive story on Goldberg towards the end of February. And uh, in a weird little trivia note that we'll mention here, his girlfriend, Lisa, uh, in years prior, was a diamond doll for DDP when he used that as a gimmick. Uh, and he had already become friendly, he being Goldberg, uh, with Sting and Lex uh, since they worked out at the same gym. So the original idea, at least from Goldberg's point of view, was for him to be named the hybrid or the hybrid fighter. But there was some sort of trademark problem with a clothing company called Hybrid Clothes. Mm-hmm. And uh, Goldberg noted that the push he's getting is very unique and compared himself to the Ultimate Warrior and Magnum T.A., uh, any recollection of uh, there being a discussion of a hybrid name? I mean, I know you yeah. don't remember what to call him, but when you were kind of throwing out freestyle names for nicknames, was hybrid mm-hmm. ever something you heard? Yeah, it's something that I heard discussed uh, in in, uh, in in talking to members of the booking committee, but nothing that I – and I'm sure they did their work as far as trying to uh, trademark it. Uh, I don't – you know, I – this comparison, I guess Goldberg made the comparison to himself and the Ultimate Warrior. I, I don't know about that. I, how do you not know about it? In that he couldn't work a long match. It was a lot of high intensity. He had a reputation for hurting guys. That yeah. to me all kind of lines up. I mean, yeah. In early March, I, go ahead. I just, I just thought, I just thought, and I know, I'm, I know Ultimate Warrior made a lot of money, but. Uh, I just thought Goldberg was a little bit more, I don't know, maybe it was the Ultimate War gimmick that. Yeah, the tassels that, in the paint throws you off. Yeah, and, and shaking the ropes and everything kind of overshadowed everything and then made you look at the gimmick itself than just what he did. But I thought Goldberg was much better in the ring than the Ultimate Warrior was. Agreed that neither one could probably do a long match. Right. But... Goldberg's, and I guess it's because the jackhammer looks so legit. Uh, Goldberg came across to me a uh, much better performer than the Ultimate Warrior did. Um, that's just my my own take. In early yeah. March, it comes out that uh, Ahmed Johnson was trying to get Bischoff to sign him to uh, work with Goldberg. Thank God this didn't happen. Uh, mm-hmm. Tony, what was your favorite Ahmed Johnson match? Uh, it was the... Uh, my favorite Ahmed Johnson match was the day, uh, and Conrad, I think it was Charlotte, North Carolina. 
that he got out of a limousine, he ran down the street, he went to the offices of the Charlotte Knights baseball team, and he grabbed Tommy Viola, who is their uh, media relations manager, who is also known as a luchador's El Shitstorm Viola, beat him up with a baseball bat, ran back, got into the limousine, and left. I remember that well. Meltzer gave it yeah, four and a half yeah. stars. So what I'm telling you, I don't remember a fucking thing about Ahmed Jones. <laughs> That's what I was hoping okay. you'd say. Okay. That's what I was hoping so, Okay, for. I'm looking up Ahmed Johnson right now. Okay, and I'm looking up the I'm looking up uh, uh, pictures, you know, images of Ahmed Johnson. Yeah. You know who pops up? Who? Abdullah the Butcher. Wow. Yeah, so I don't even think the internet remembers him. That's phenomenal. Uh, but no, I know he he was pretty big and he was pretty strong and he had a good look and he was tied in. I guess we tied him into Harlem Heat or whatever. But uh, I don't. He he did not register with me. Uh, he didn't register with anybody past like 1997. Um, but here's the deal. Let's run through this. Uh, this is worth mentioning. Uh, this is March, so he's debuted now. He Ben Goldberg. About six months prior, he's been on television. He's been on pay-per-view. He's getting huge pops everywhere it goes, sometimes the biggest pop on a house show. And at this point, six months in, there's still no Goldberg merchandise available. Tony, would this ever happen with Vince McMahon during this time? I mean, let's remember, this is a time where Vince has Sable and Sonny strutting that ass down the ramp and an Undertaker T-shirt every week on Raw. Right. No, it wouldn't. And that shows... The disconnect of WCW, uh, and uh, that shows that that WCW was just a a a, a family that was very dysfunctional. Uh, I I don't know if I don't know if the booking committee or Eric was kayfabing the uh, the merchandise people, or the merchandise people weren't savvy enough to take a look and watch our shows and see what's going on, or if they haven't even decided of a name yet. Uh, but it just shows – I think that encapsules where we were as a company compared to the WWE. By uh, late March, the very first uh, article about Goldberg being Jewish uh, surfaces. Mm-hmm. It's uh, Baltimore Jewish Times, and they do a whole feature on Goldberg. And in here we discover that his father was an obstetrician – uh, and a gynecologist for years at John Hopkins University, and right. Goldberg himself um, is Jewish. And that has not really been marketed up until this point by WCW, but it would later go on to pay some dividends for the company and for Goldberg as far as promotion goes from the mainstream media. When do you remember that coming up for the first time, Shivani? Well, uh, well Thompson, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't ever remember that coming up. Uh, as far as him being Jewish, I remember hearing about his his father. I think go and I may be wrong here. I think Goldberg's mother's last name is Wolfson, and uh, the Wolfson uh, family name is very very big in Florida. Uh, and I think there's a children's hospital in Jacksonville, the Wolfson Children's Hospital, and I think uh, Bill's family is is part of that. So I knew that that Bill came from a very well to do family. And as far as his religion was concerned. Never even came to any of our discussions as far as uh, the booking committee talking to us about talking about his religion. Never came to us at all. Uh, Never came to all. What you did start talking about at this point was Goldberg's undefeated streak, and it became okay. a big deal for every match that he had. Do you remember when the idea of a streak was first discussed, like as far as in the back, hey, we should start talking about this? This guy hadn't lost yet. Was it was it on purpose? Was it accidental? How did this come about? I think it was accidental. I think the fact that they realized that he's had all these matches uh, that he hasn't lost, and let's talk about a winning streak because of something we can tie on him. When exactly it happened, I don't know. When? How far did the winning streak go? 173 matches. Okay, we're probably talking about 50 or 60 into it. Whether it was legitimately 50 or 60 matches or not, I don't know. Uh, and I guess you could throw in the house shows. Maybe someone looked at all the house shows and counted them up. But I, I kind of thought we were padding the number. Oh, yeah. Uh, Towards the end, you definitely work the number. You would work it both ways, making it higher and lower, depending on what the narrative was for TV that week. Right. So yeah. here's something that maybe uh, not a lot of folks didn't know, myself included. And, and Meltzer oh. would write in April 
Uh, now there's talk of bringing back Ric Flair and reintroducing a new four horsemen with Arn Anderson as the spokesperson for the group with G- Bill Goldberg as one of the members, largely to put Goldberg in the spotlight and still protect him from the public seeing his weaknesses. Similar to the way Dusty Rhodes did this with Luger in 87 when yeah. he was groomed to be the next top guy. Uh, do you remember this being an idea? Supposedly, yeah. Meltzer would suggest it would be Ric Flair, Lex Luger, Bill Goldberg, and another performer not named Chris Benoit. Okay. I, I don't rem- I remember it being discussed. Uh, and, uh, I, I just remember that what I remember about, about that is them trying to, you know, we were very big into trying to take success from the past and make it work, uh, in the now, so to speak If the now you can call it the mid nineties. Sure. And I remember, I remember just thinking that, you know, they're trying to reinvent the horseman because the, the horseman name and the four fingers up. Uh, were were kind of a, a big deal, but I, I guess nothing came about of that. So, you know, we had a, there was a lot of shit again thrown up against the wall uh, that I guess didn't work. Uh, well, something that we can probably all agree on did work, and we should probably take a minute here to uh, talk about what Arn Anderson describes as the carpenters of the business. Um, Many wrote that guys like Dave Finley and Jerry Flynn and Eugene Nagata were giving Goldberg his best matches, even described as hot matches. And this is a guy who is very green and very early in his career and just, you know, his knowledge of professional wrestling. Uh, Tony, why do you think in an era today where so many fans are quote unquote smart that the importance of this carpenter role is somehow lost on them? Hmm. Um, I, mean, I don't. I, I just. I think. Boy, you, you've stumped me with that one. Uh, it's it, the business has changed so much. It, it's not what it was. It's. Uh, I. You know. I always say that uh, a great match takes. Two. Always took a, a guy that could call a match. Right. And could lead a match. Uh, I just don't know if there are any great carpenters left. Uh. Do you see anything where you say there's a there's a a great carpenter left? I mean, I I know that you know I read some things that there's some things out of Japan, some great workers, but well, you've got to be able to you got to be able to have a person to lead a match. Well, you know, rather than name a name, you know, in 2017 that maybe would upset anybody. Let's talk yeah. about a name from the past. A guy like George South could have a really really good match. Yes, and, you know, he's a great trainer now, and he certainly yeah. has uh, a very important role in the history of professional wrestling, whether it's Jim Crockett or, or training guys or whatever it is. But maybe he didn't have, you know, 10 T-shirts out. and Maybe he didn't headline a Starcade. But his role was just as important as the guys who did have 10 T-shirts and did headline a Starcade because they couldn't have been in that role if it weren't for somebody like George South across the ring from him. Right, right. But when you but you mentioned Fit Finley uh, and the, the Fit Finley was probably a, a little bit higher than George South. Sure. As far as, far as the name recognition is concerned, and and that meant that meant a lot more. But I, I just uh, just a lot of times these days you hear, oh, he's a jobber, and 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 when a guy loses a match on TV, he's a jobber. Let me just get this clear: if you're wrestling on TV in 2017, you're probably pretty damn good. I can't yes, say you that you're not talented. You're, you're on TV. You probably know a thing or two. You're probably pretty decent. Right. Right. Well, it used to be, you know, that back then if you, and that was the concern with some of the wrestlers back then, if I lose a match, then I'm going to be perceived as a jobber and I won't get booked. I won't get money. And, and I'm sure it's changed a great deal today because there's a lot of guys get losing on TV. Um, but those guys were important back then. If, if I, I'm, I know I'm regressing here. It, it, it was important back then, and it was important as announcers to make them seem like good wrestlers too. Uh, the more we put over a guy like George South, the uh, the uh, more the better the win was for the guy who beat him. Right. Um, the, and the, one of the the thing the, one of the lost arts of wrestling I, I I always thought was as we moved on is that you as a star. You needed to put over that guy a little bit too as the as the match was going on because it made you look better in the end. 
if you made the guy seem a little bit tougher as the match went on and you put over some of his moves, then when you won the match, it made you look better. Right. And I always thought that that uh, that was a lost art. And and I think a lot of that lost art came with uh, I guess you can you can go back to uh, the the advent of the Road Warriors. A lot of people say the Road Warriors, when they came in, they didn't sell shit. Uh, they would get hit and hit and hit, and they didn't sell it. Uh, and then you can, I guess, you can talk about Nikita too, back then, and you can talk about Goldberg. Uh, they didn't sell shit, uh, and I know that's probably a, a wrong term to use, but they didn't sell as much as the other guys did. Uh, so where am I going here? What the fuck's my name? Probably, you, probably an old folks' home. But before we go there, <laughs> let's talk about the first weekend of April. This Let me get when, my teeth out of this glass here, Conrad. There, well, I like the red velvet treatment. Uh, okay. G- Goldberg was finally released, uh, or his merchandise was finally released this first weekend yeah. of April. And they do this through a loop uh, for Fort Myers, Fort Pierce, Montgomery, and Chattanooga. So B towns all the way across, or maybe C towns. Uh, and on that loop, they do $352,000 worth of merchandise. And the Goldberg stuff is a big seller everywhere. Uh, one show in particular in Minneapolis, the Goldberg T-shirt alone did twenty-eight thousand dollars worth of sales at a single show, which was about eighteen percent of the total merchandise sold. And I found this interesting. It's a quote from Meltzer again. Interesting mm-hmm. that the first full week of Goldberg merchandise, the Goldberg merchandise is already the big seller, but the actual average per head is way down because for whatever reason, the Sting and other stuff has plummeted. Um, do you have any memories? of why this may have been and what the talk may have been. Did Goldberg just take all the, st- all the steam out of Sting and uh, as far as for, at the merchandise stand? Do you remember that being a thing or a topic? I don't remember being a topic, but I, I think that's pretty logical uh, that, that Goldberg's – because of the, the, the lack of Goldberg merchandise up until that point. There's an appetite for it now, yeah. Right, exactly, an appetite and a hunger for it. So uh, I can understand that happening. Uh, but I don't, I don't remember being that much talk about it. Do you recall any of the ways that uh, WCW paid guys on merchandise at the time? Kevin Nash has been critical of this in the past, saying it did not compare to the way the WWF did it at the time. I, I don't know how the WWF did it, but I, I do know that that I did get paid for some merchandising, uh, basically on my video games. Right. And there was no regular basis for that. All of a sudden, I would get a check and... Uh, and I remember reading my contract that, you know, that I would get paid so much for licensing or whatever. But there was n- – I never remember – and I have to go look back at my old contracts that I think I have uh, and, and see if there was a regular basis for when we got paid. I don't think there was because my con- my uh, merchandise contract was basically my video game work. Sure. Uh, I, guess, I guess I got paid for some cards, trading cards or whatever came haphazardly so and so i can understand what nash was thinking because again it goes back to what i was thinking how wwe was a very polished business and we tried to be and i guess at one time got to that point didn't last long uh and um and then fell off it's worth mentioning here that goldberg's first contract was set to expire in the spring of 98 uh, but before that happens he re-signs a four-year deal uh, and Meltzer writes, reports on Goldberg's contract vary depending upon the source, uh, with more reliable port reports seem to be something in the range of four years at $2.4 million, which mm. would be 400000 this year, two years at 600000 and then the final year at 800000 So he's been in the business now for less than eight months, uh, and he's just been upgraded to a $2.4 million contract. Uh, do you do you remember there being any conversation at this point? We're spring of ninety eight here, Tony. That there was any real concern that Goldberg might be leaving? Uh, how does a guy get a push like this with an undefeated streak and no long term contract in place? Well, I, I guess the, the the same way it can be, you put him in the ring for his first match and not know who the fuck he is. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously you you do, and I'm sure there was concern about him leaving. I. You know, I, I I have to say, and uh, uh, Meltzer's probably got the numbers right, but that seems a little low to me. Even Based, even eight months in, you think? Yeah, 
That seems a little low. Well, he would get a pay raise that July, so just a few months later. Uh, when Goldberg defeated Saturn at Spring Stampede, consecutive win. It's an eight-minute match that was described as having the most heat of any on the card. And mm-hmm. on that same show, we saw DDP lose his United States title to Raven. The next night, Goldberg would challenge Raven for the title. So obviously, they're only getting the belt off of DDP uh, and on to Raven so he can then drop it the next night. And that was April 20th. And this is kind of the anointing of Goldberg here. And it firmly establishes the obvious that Goldberg is a big money player. He's getting big money pops. Uh, He's uh, blowing up the merchandise stand. uh, And now he has a big match with Raven that they kind of build for the entire first hour. Uh, It's his first title spot. And uh, they put it in what is traditionally the death spot for WCW, uh, which is right when Raw is coming on the air. And it draws a 5.7 rating compared to Vince's 3.7. And to show the interest level in Goldberg, when it was over, this rating goes from a 5.7 to a 4.6. So there you go. Uh, At at the end of this recap, Meltzer is already kind of freestyling. WCW uh, will probably in the future try to get Goldberg to a 99-0 record and go for number 100 against Hogan. Uh, do you remember this particular night where, uh, and it's worth mentioning about the match, Goldberg in this match with Raven wins with a jackhammer, surprise, uh, but it happens on top of a stop sign, and this is a match that's only about five minutes long, but in it, Goldberg no-sells a shot from a stop sign, which is the exact same move that beat DDP the night before, and then jackhammers the near 400-pound Ron Rice or Reese or however you say his name, I can't wait till we use his other name with Tony. With, with one day it, with Tony in the future, do you <laughs> remember this particular match though? Being like, holy shit! Look at the rating this guy got. Uh, we've got something. This is a really big deal. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I remember that. I, I, I think we, I think we knew that before then, though. Uh, and and I I didn't check the ratings so I wasn't close to checking the ratings like like let me tell you my job at WCW uh, I was a producer I was named an executive producer when I first came back uh, and then again because we were such a dysfunctional family my job just bounced around uh, during the Nitro days I, I was a producer of WCW Saturday Night basically uh, formatting the show. And uh, making sure the show was done right, uh, I, I made some mistakes. So uh, the, the work that I did during the week was not about Nitro. The work that I did about the week was about the other shows. So I, I don't think I was as close to what the Nitro ratings were as Bischoff and the uh, the booking committee were at that time. But I do remember thinking that, yeah, we do have something special here. Well, and you did, and uh, we got yeah. something special coming out of this because we had a series of matches with uh, Perry Saturn as we started to head towards uh, Slamboree, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk about Perry in the future. He's been going through some rough times. Yeah, that's, um, that's what I understand, yeah. A- any memories of working with Perry? Yeah, Perry was a pro, man. Perry was a, a good guy. Uh, he was, you know, he, he looked different. You know, He had a different look about him, but... Uh, when you talk about Goldberg having good matches with Perry Saturn, that says a lot about about Perry. I liked him a lot. He was a good, good guy. Uh, and uh, I know he's fallen on some hard times right now, and that saddens me. But uh, he was a good worker, really good worker. Another good worker was on the May 11th edition of Nitro from Kansas City. Goldberg beat who today referred to as a very accomplished grappler, Lynn Denton. Uh, this would be match number 84. Lynn Denton. Uh, Lynn Denton is on Nitro in May of '98. How the fuck does this happen? I don't. I guess they're looking for people to to uh, put the jackhammer on. Right? I, I guess. Lynn Denton. Lynn Denton blew me away. Uh, around this time, it's reported, uh, "quote Several people are submitting their own booking ideas as to where they can be the one who beats Goldberg first. Uh, do you remember hearing any one name pitched in particular and just laughing at the idea? No, I don't remember that shit. That's, that's hilarious <laughs> I don't to me. That. Uh, I, I, I do know that the booking committee always was looking for ideas. 
And if a wrestler had an idea, uh, they they probably would take it and, and you know listen to them because you know they were cranking out a lot of shit back then, right? Absolutely. And, and when you're cranking out a lot of shit, you got to pull from from everywhere. Um, but uh, I don't remember any one person saying, "I've got this idea how I can be Goldberg." I mean, if, if Goldberg look, if Goldberg to me the common sense thing is if Goldberg is is hot and we're drawing big ratings with Goldberg, then that means everybody's making more money. Right. Everybody's doing well. So, you know, that that seems to me to be a more of an ego thing instead of a team player thing. But I'm sure that there were a lot of egos out there trying to come up with their own, own ideas. Spring of 98 and WCW was just a giant clusterfuck. I don't know of another way to describe wow, it. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, WCW was just a giant clusterfuck in hindsight. Okay. Well, well I'm enjoying discussing this clusterfuck with you. Okay. Um, okay. This is Clusterfuck Monday. Good to have you with us. Okay. Absolutely. Hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends all about it. Uh, so let's think about this. Goldberg is now the U.S. champion. He's one of your hottest acts in the promotion. He's your new U.S. champion. He's He's got all this merch. He's popping big ratings. Uh, we've got to put him on pay-per-view. Of course, we've got a pay-per-view coming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but inside of a six day span, uh, the match bounces around from, it's going to be Raven. It's going to be Saturn. It's going to be Kurt. Who is he wrestling? Nobody fucking knows in the no, end. Really. He, he mm-hmm. actually wrestles Perry Saturn, uh, and they get a three quarter star match here. How in the world does this happen? I mean, is everybody so fo- is Bischoff so focused on the main event? And I'm sure we'll talk about Slamboree in particular because this is the one where he challenged Vince McMahon, and we'll talk about that at another time. But what's going on here where nobody's paying attention to the hottest act, and he has no fucking match? And oh, by the way, he's the U.S. champion. Yeah, that that happened a lot. There there was a lot of miscommunication between the booking committee and and Eric and. The, the, the television people. I don't know if it stems from the old kayfabe thing or not. And if it does, it's fucking stupid, right? Right. Uh, but I, I just, I just, that's just to me the kind of the, one of the tips of the iceberg. I think that not knowing what to call Goldberg just shows you how fucked up things were. Give you a perfect example. And I think it was, we were in Miami and uh, we, we, uh, <coughs> We had this. We had this promotion, and I believe we ran spots for it. About we're looking for the next Nitro Girl, right? And that night, Kimberly came in the ring with some girls and did a Nitro Girls audition. Now I'm just glossing over this. I'm, I may have the details wrong. And I remember think, thinking, we've got this Nitro spot running about getting a new Nitro Girl, and we're doing an angle about a Nitro Girl in the ring that's completely different than what we're doing. And I remember going to Bishop. I said, do you realize what happened tonight on TV? I said, Kimberly did this Nitro Girl audition, and we're looking for a brand new Nitro Girl. Doesn't that seem fucked up to you? He went, fuck. And he was really pissed off about it. And that told me that either he didn't know what the booking committee was doing, or the booking committee was doing things uh, and not realizing what the marketing hand was doing. Does right. that make sense to you? Yeah, left hand doesn't know what the, the same right hand's night. Doing. I mean, it, it just... To me, that was one of the things that we did that was just so fucked up. We were so disorganized at times that the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. And I don't know if that's a fault of anybody's, uh, but that's just uh, poor communications. Uh, I can also tell you some, uh, and this is uh, for uh, another edition, I can also tell you some times that we went on the air and I didn't have a format. Wow. And uh, uh, this girl, Annette, who was uh, work with Craig Leathers, it was kind of like uh, one of the liaisons would come out and hand me uh, segments as we were going on. Uh, and uh, and I remember Th- Bischoff saying that, you know, if we got a good idea, we got to go with it. We can't just you know, we that's the way it is. And, you know, I, I do know that uh, that's the way television was. You know, a lot of times things change on the fly, even with the most successful shows. Right. Uh, you know, we went out and did the movie Ready to Rumble. And there was a lot of disorganization in that as far as, you know, what to do and create creativity. Someone has a better idea. Well, let's go with that. Uh, but there was just there was just so much going on that a lot of times shit would fall through the cracks. And, and I really think that 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 Goldberg was the epitome of that. He was he was so good and such a big star 
They didn't know what to call him. They were behind on the merchandise. Uh, they didn't know who the, he would be wrestling in that, that pay-per-view match. I think that was the epitome of it. Here We had our biggest star, and a lot of times we dropped the ball on what to do, something I don't think Vince and, and them would have done in the WWE. Well, uh, they did get some stuff right. On May 29th, WCW Tribute. puts tickets on sale for the July 6th visit to the Georgia Dome, and it looks like they're going to set a record in a hurry. Uh, with no matches announced whatsoever, WCW sold over 14,000 tickets for over $541,000 in sales, and that's with no matches announced. It actually beat the Starcade 97 gate by $120, and it did it in its very first day. Uh, by a couple of days later, June 1st, they were over 17,000 tickets sold, and there were over 623,000 tickets, or $623,000 uh, so this is uh, really, really going to break uh, major records here. And upon hearing these numbers, surprise, surprise, Hulk Hogan volunteers to work a non-title dark match on the show against Goldberg. And Meltzer writes of this, and this is pretty smart. This is one of the reasons Hogan is where he is in the business. All those tickets have already been sold without anyone having knowledge of the match. No doubt when the match is officially announced locally in about a week, it will help sales even more. And with it being the final Nitro before the San Diego pay-per-view where both Rodman and another celebrity are expected to shoot a major angle at the show, uh, this will be pushed heavily. WCW was planning for a 24,000 seat setup, uh, but now the tickets are going so well, they're going to expand it to a 38,000 seat setup and could approach a million dollar gate for the first time in the history of the company and the first time in the United States for anyone other than the WWF, which had at that point done it six times. Uh, and with all this is said and done and the event is over, it won't be remembered as WCW Nitro drawing the house or Rodman doing an angle. It will be Hogan and Goldberg drew the house. And more importantly, Turner and Time Warner bigwigs, some of whom will be in the building that night, will be amazed at the crowd for a wrestling event. And of course, attributed to Hogan since he's the biggest name in the main event. Uh, so there's so much to cover on this July show that we'll get to in a minute. But before we do that, when you hear these records are being made and then broken just a few months later, because there was a record set in January, we just talked about it at the Georgia Dome, and now we're breaking it already. And all of that broke the Starcade record from the month before in December. Uh, do you feel like this is, you know, the, the pinnacle of WCW? Because I know for years and years you had to think, well, we're going out of business any day now. And now you're mm -hmm. setting records every few months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was our this was our high spot. This was our this is our biggest our biggest deal. And I think a lot of that. I, I think the, uh, WCW's became was put on the map by us signing Hulk Hogan. I don't think there's any question about that, because, uh, yeah, we had the uh, we had the hardcore, if I can use that term, wrestling fans. They would watch us and the old school wrestling fans. But when we got Hogan, that exposed our business, <laughs> what a term, to a whole new uh, group of fans because he was a big name. And anybody who will tell you, uh, there was a guy who worked in our pay-per-view, uh, uh, and I can't remember his name. Uh, I uh, There was a guy that said that our pay-per-view buys – uh, for the first Hogan match, which I guess was in Orlando. That's right. Okay. Uh, our our buys for our pay-per-view match went through the roof and were through the roof ever since Hogan was with us. So I think I, I think we I think we neglect sometimes to talk about how much of an impact Hogan made on WCW. And I don't think there was any question that night was our biggest night. Well, because it looked like to me, and I know it was half, I know they, you know, they curtained it off and everything, or did they? It just looked like to me that we had completely sold out the Georgia Dome. And, uh, you know, Atlanta was our home. And uh, that was, that to me, that, that seemed to be the pinnacle of what, of everything that we had ever done. Let's, uh, let's talk about Hogan. Do you think this is mastermind level stuff here for him to sneak into the top spot after the show was already on pace to smash the records? Or is this just Dave trying to villainize the Hulkster brother? Yeah, I, I think Dave is trying to villainize the Hulkster, but I think a lot of that because Hogan had that apparently is out in his contract or that he had final say on his character. Right. Uh, I think a lot of that was done. 
<laughs> I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, but I think that was the only way Eric Bischoff was able to sign Hogan to give him final say on his character. Sure. Uh, but well, uh, I don't. I don't know if I, I don't know if Hogan sneaking in at the very end uh, was Hogan being Hulk Hogan or not. On the uh, June first Nitro, Goldberg runs through Laparca, no selling his chair shots, and seemingly tearing Laparca's ACL in the process. Uh, I can't wait for us to talk about uh, the chairman of the board another time, Tony. But before we move on, who was your favorite luchador, and why was it Laparca? Uh, okay, my favorite luchador was again El Shitstorm Viola. <laughs> okay, uh, who could forget uh, his classics with Ahmed Johnson? I know they they were great uh, to the point where Ahmed got out of that limousine and went all the way to the Charlotte baseball offices and beat the shit out of him with a two by four. Uh, I hadn't listen. I I'm sorry, uh, and I guess I was old school, but I had no I didn't have any time for any luchador match because I didn't. Uh, again, to me, uh, to me, the hallmark of the business is selling, and they didn't sell shit. They were just they were just after high spots, right. high spot after high spot after high spot, which were exciting and made the fans go woo. But if you don't sell shit, the high spots don't mean anything. Right, and that was just me. So I don't know Laparca. Who else? Give me some other luchador names. Uh, we'll get them into them another time. Uh, Goldberg starts main <laughs> eventing house show loops on June thirteenth. This is the first time he's main eventing now. Uh, he's on top with Conan and Booker T and Chris Benoit are working underneath. Uh, so Goldberg is drawing huge crowds and pops, uh, for the on sale date appearances that they would do. And, yeah. uh, they don't do this anymore, but back in the day, what they would do is they would send a major uh, talent to a major market. The day tickets go on sale to try to drive the, the, the first day ticket sales. And there were reports of up to 10,000, uh, tickets being sold on a single Goldberg appearance. So as a promoter, the advanced ticket sales are critical to your business, uh, but the irony of this is by pulling Goldberg and sending him uh, to do some of these events, he actually misses the house shows where he was advertised. Uh, mm. and, and, of course, WCW doesn't offer any refunds. Uh, mm. do, when do you remember this concept of an appearance for on-day or same-day ticket sales, uh, the day they go on sale, being a thing? Is this a Bischoff idea or had this been yeah. in the business for a long time? No, I, I think this was a Bischoff idea. And I think it all started with Goldberg. I, no, I, yeah, you know, Eric had some great ideas, man. I mean, he really did. Absolutely. Say, say what you want about him, but WCW didn't become what we were, and would have become what we were had they not moved Eric into that spot. He had a pretty, pretty big vision. A uh, pretty big pop here on the June eighth uh, Nitro. Goldberg gets win number ninety nine against Chavo Guerrero Jr. It's from Auburn Hills, Michigan, and Meltzer writes the crowd went absolutely nuts even more than ever before for Goldberg or probably any pro wrestler ever in existence aside from Anoki at any point in history. Do you remember these pops garnering jealousy from the boys? Uh, no, no, okay. I'm sure it did, but it, I, I can't remember there being like this upheaval or up, uh, or, uh, uprising in the, in the locker room because of, of Goldberg getting the pops. I, I, I don't, it seems to me that that Meltzer was pretty much into conflict between wrestler A and wrestler B backstage. Right. Uh, and I'm not so sure. I, I'm sure in hindsight, maybe some of the guys called him and, and didn't like this, didn't like that. But I don't think they ever uh, – some of them did, I'm sure. But I don't think they ever as a as a unit were pissed off about Goldberg getting the push. Because let's face it, I mean you were talking about – the reaction that Goldberg got, uh, how much money uh, that WCW made with him, uh, I don't know. I mean, if I'm a team player, I'm, I'm enjoying it. So we're at Great American Bash, and uh, Bill Goldberg pins Conan in under two minutes to retain the U.S. title. And um, there's lots of uh, discussion backstage about who was going to be win 100. Uh, Kurt Henning was uh, allegedly upset because he wanted to be the guy who screwed Goldberg on his 100th win and had words with Bischoff. Um, and then Kevin Nash was unhappy with the whole process. And this is kind of somewhat silly because it's marketed as his 100th win. Uh, but they actually said uh, that his win on Nitro 
uh, was number 99 and didn't, didn't count the house show matches. They wanted to save and make 100 a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is when the streak kind of is revealed as being not this grand master plan because they didn't really have it laid out. Uh, right. But I want to talk about those house shows that we were touching on that he was going to main event. Uh, June 13th in Pittsburgh, they drew 3,600 fans. Uh, Pittsburgh's a pretty decent size market. 3,600 is all they drew. Uh, the day before in Erie, they drew 2,400 fans. Um, so it just failed. Goldberg in the main event position uh, did not make him a big ticket seller. And I, I found this enlightening because you look back at Goldberg at this time and you tend to think of him being the top guy in every way. Uh, you know, you hear about all this merchandise, you hear about the big ratings, but then when you see less than 2,500 fans, I kind of scratch my head. Yeah. Uh, well, 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 let me ask you this. Is that because, uh, of, uh, of Goldberg not being able to draw a house show or because that we didn't give a fuck about house shows back then? Well, let me read the card to you and let you form your own opinion. Chris Adams okay. beat Barry Darso. Marty Jannetty beat Scotty Riggs, Norman right. Smiley and Ciclope beat the Villanos <laughs> four and five Chavo Guerrero jr. Beat Billy Kidman yeah. uh, public enemy beat high voltage in a street fight. Dean wow. Malone, Booker okay. T beat Chris Benoit. And in the main event, uh, Goldberg beat Conan. Okay. Yeah. So okay. that, right. uh, that did so poorly that the next night sting volunteered to lose to Goldberg in Pittsburgh. Okay. Okay. Conrad, I'm telling you, we, we're moving into a different age now to where this WCW is now a television show. Right. And if I'm going to watch Monday Night Show every Monday and then watch Thunder, I'm not going to spend my money going to a house show. Right. I, I, I just I, I don't I don't know if it says a lot about Goldberg or if it says a lot about the direction of the business then. Well, but, you know, right then we're we're pushing pay per views and we're pushing uh, watch on Monday Nitro and we got to go. We're out of fucking time. <laughs> that, I, that I said a million times. I, I just I, I just think the business has changed, and I I don't you know with maybe uh, again maybe with Hogan on the card and the fans have never seen Hogan live and he still was the biggest star ever. Uh, maybe that would have given the house shows a little bit more, but the house shows to me and and. I don't know how they're doing today. They may be doing well. They're not huge. Okay. The house shows ain't what they used to be, and that was the beginning of it. Because everything you needed to get your wrestling fix was right there on Nitro. Winners and losers, not squash matches, angles coming back. You know, it's not when – I, when I say we're out of time on Nitro, I'm not saying, hey, go to the house show and see it continued. I'm saying come back to Monday Nitro next Monday. Right. So they're an afterthought, and I don't know if you can blame Goldberg on that or not. Well, let's talk about something that we can't blame Goldberg for, and that's the Goldberg chance being piped in. Um, The June 22nd edition of The Observer is the first time it was written about. uh, He wrote, Goldberg destroyed Rick Fuller in a minute 30 with all the fake Goldberg chants. Someone desperately on this show needed to instruct the directors that when they're piping in the fake Goldberg chants, don't show close-ups of the crowd. Uh, because all you'll hear are the loud chants, and you'll see that nobody in that camera range is actually chanting, and people are going to pick up on this. Yeah. Um, I have to admit, I thought the piping of uh, the chants was done well after he won the title, and in doing my research, I didn't expect to see it happen before the end of June. Do you remember there being a conversation about, hey, shit, we may need to pipe in the chants. They're starting to turn on him a little bit. Whose idea was that, and who was for it? I have a feeling that was something with with Eric and and uh, there we had uh, the guy who was head of our TV, Craig Leathers, uh, doing that. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not so sure that was because they were turning against him, or maybe they just wanted to to build him up even more. And I don't remember in my headset what you were saying about, or what Meltzer was saying about seeing the fans and then hearing the Goldberg chant and thinking, boy, that doesn't look right. Uh, but, uh, that had, that was something I'm sure between Bischoff and, and Craig Leathers. It's interesting in 2017, uh, they're still doing this with somebody, uh, who most everybody listening to, uh, knows what we're referencing there on the same edition of nitro. It became apparent they were building towards Goldberg teaming with Kevin green, the Carolina Panther against Kurt Henning and the giant. 
and this was the angle for Bash at the Beach. And as a reminder, the main event of that show is Dennis Rodman and Hulk Hogan against Carl Malone and DDP. Mm. Uh, and around this time, another article comes out about Goldberg, uh, and it's in New York, and it's, again, regarding his Jewish faith. This time he mentions uh, that he wanted to use the Star of David for his character. Do you remember mm. that ever coming up as maybe no. something he'd wear on his tights or boots or something like that? No, I do not. Uh, on the last Nitro of June 97, Michael Buffer would do Sounds the, like a deposi- deposition, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Well, that's you what it is. Mr. Shivani, the day that Ric Flair's dick came out of his tights? No, sir, I was not. <laughs> I, th- I think it was a Starcade, and uh, I think that Tommy Young put it back in for him. <laughs> I could be wrong on that, though. Wow. There's a whole nother story. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, but, and it's not a very long story. Michael Buffer did the main event introductions for Goldberg and Glacier in the last match on the show. We've murdered Tony. Uh, Goldberg <laughs> injured Glacier's knee on the spear. Kind of a little bit of a trend there. Yeah. Uh, by June 29th, the advance for the Georgia Dome show, which was July 6th, is up to over 25,000, nearly 26,000 tickets. And it's crossed the $800,000 mark. It's at 831. Uh, and the announcement of Hogan and Goldberg did not lead to a jump start of ticket sales as they'd already sold 20,000 plus. Uh, but locally, they started advertising that you can only see this match in Atlanta rather than saying it won't be on TV. So at least then the idea was make it a dark match. And Tony, mm-hmm. conventional wisdom here would say Goldberg Hogan should be for the title and it should be on pay per view and it's huge money. Do you remember when the decision was made internally that this isn't a dark match? This is our main event. It had to be. It had to be the week leading up to it. Yeah, Meltzer guesses that it was made on July second, uh, the day yeah, that he, Thunder was taped, because the uh, ratings didn't come out the way they wanted. Eric panicked and then decided to just go ahead and have JJ Dillon announce that that would headline Nitro in just four days, which seems yeah. crazy to me. Yeah, well, again, going on the fly, and we things changed, you know, basically on the fly a lot. I told you about getting the the uh, formats uh, segment by segment. At sometimes things, the 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 more success we had, it seemed like the more we second guessed ourselves. Right. And uh, a lot of times that's good, and a lot of times that's bad, because the disorganization that we had backstage, eventually you saw on the air, uh, with things. Things ended up being a clusterfuck. I think we've used that term before. But, yeah, Meltzer's probably right. That probably happened as a panic uh, to change it uh, uh, right at the last minute. And it should be stated here again that Goldberg has been on TV for less than 10 months. He's 31 years old. He's the top merch guy for the company. He's undefeated. He's the U.S. champion. And um, we're going to beat this decision up. But we should know we should note that the Georgia Dome is the fourth largest crowd to ever see pro wrestling in the United States. When it's all said and done, there's 41,000 plus in the building. Mm-hmm. And this wow. entire episode was built around Goldberg. They showed clips of him warming up and then highlights of wins number one, number 25, 50, 75, and 100. And they even have Hogan cut a promo saying he can only get this shot if he first beats another NWO member. So they give... Uh, Another opportunity to have two Goldberg matches on the show. This is how deep the ratings battle was. So Goldberg beat Scott Hall in under six minutes. Um, Tony, I mean, no disrespect to talented performers we've discussed earlier today, like Rick Fuller and Glacier and Mike Enos and guys like that. But now Scott Hall here with this loss, he's always been presented as a top guy from the day he debuted with you. And now he's losing on Nitro in a match that was never even advertised uh, and this is a time when Scott has a lot of personal problems. Is this more of a punishment of sorts, or, or, or how does this make sense at all? This only makes sense in that as the Goldberg story needs to go along, and again, as we're focusing more on television matches and trying to get you to watch TV, I think this only goes with the line of he needs to start beating guys who mean a lot more and a lot more. I don't think this was a, a punishment for Scott Hall at all. I, I think this was a fact that, they were wanted to push Goldberg, and for Goldberg to continue to mean something, you've got to have him be booked against and have him on TV against a legitimate uh, main eventer, and Scott Hall was that. 
Uh, it's worth mentioning here that this show is going head to head with Raw, where DX is impersonating the Nation of Domination and the infamous Brawl for All that Tony com- completely forgot about, like everybody else did. Okay, I got to see that. Um, now the rumor here, Tony, is that Hogan has only agreed to drop the belt on TV like this. Uh, with the understanding that when the time is right, Hogan would be the person to end Goldberg's winning streak. Do you remember there being a conversation like that or an understanding? I don't remember being a conversation like that, but I can I can tell you that that probably did happen. Uh, interesting to note, Goldberg and Hogan would never have a singles match ever again. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's get to the match. Hogan leg drops uh, Goldberg twice. Goldberg kicks out. At this point, Kurt comes out for the run-in, and this brings out DDP and Malone. Uh, this time with Malone giving a diamond cutter to Kurt. And this was the cue for the spear and the jackhammer at 8 minutes and 12 seconds with a huge post-match celebration of Goldberg holding up both titles and being billed as the first wrestler to ever win a world title, having never lost a pro wrestling match. Um, and Broadman, pretty great, pretty great storyline there if you think about it. It's phenomenal. And Rodman yeah. no-showed the event. Did that overshadow this at all? No, uh, yeah. From a mainstream no, standpoint? No, no, no. Well, maybe from a mainstream point, because, you know, the use of guys like Rodman and Jay Leno and uh, uh, Carl Malone, Carl Malone, those guys were very important on a on a national scope. Uh, but as I don't think it overshadowed the event. No. So as we mentioned earlier, you know, WCW was heavily criticized for not saving this Hogan Goldberg match to be a pay-per-view main event and then spending a lot of time building to it. And instead, you know, this thing is announced on a Thursday and it happens on a Monday. And in comparison to that, you guys did a phenomenal job building the Starcade 97. And most of us fans look at that show with the whole Sting Hogan match and consider it a disappointment. And maybe it was creatively or artistically or whatever, but WCW made bank with that show. It was their biggest pay-per-view in history. It was sold out, and it generated more than $7 million bucks for the company. Um, I'm curious. You've worked with Vince. If the tables were turned and Vince had this match as an option, do you think there's any chance he gives this away on Raw? Uh, yeah, I, well, yes, I do. Uh, and here's why. Uh, I want to go back to Flair Hogan. When Ric Flair first went to the WWE and everyone talked about Ric Flair against Hulk Hogan, they didn't they didn't set that up for a pay-per-view, did they? Uh, no, it never happened on pay-per-view with WWE. Exactly. And and in my mind, and I'm talking a little bit old school now, in my mind, Ric Flair against Hulk Hogan back in that day would have been the biggest match ever. So why didn't that match set up as a pay-per-view? Yeah, that's a great question, man. Um they didn't set it up for the pay-per-view because they things changed and they needed to to get money with it and they needed to do something with it right now. And if, if Hogan and Flair back then to me was the biggest match you could have and I'm talking about wrestling fans. Right. Uh and I think it ended up being at Madison Square Garden and thus probably on the MSG network. And it never I thought I thought when Flair went there that was going to be built up as the biggest pay-per-view ever that never did happen. So I think you can take a look at that and say Vince would have done the same thing and did do the same thing. Well, in fairness, those guys never wrestled in front of 41,000 people, uh, you know, for a regular television taping. So I think Vince's uh, idea at the time, of course, I wasn't there. I was fucking 11. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah, I'm 35. So in 92, really? I, I turned 11 that year. So what the fuck do I know? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Thinking, but uh, <laughs> you're, you're only 35. Yeah, is that a surprise? <laughs> I look a lot older, huh? No, you look 36. <laughs> well, I, I've always thought that maybe Vince, you know wasn't blinded as much by this ratings obsession and that the perception of winning, because that's kind of what ratings were at the time, that doesn't always take place of actually winning financially. And it feels like to me when it's your own money that you make the decision to save this for pay-per-view and just take an L in the ratings rather than, you know, chase that W in the ratings at all costs, which is kind of what this feels like. Yeah, you know, that's, that's probably a point. Uh, that is is the underlying point of why, if there is a winner 
uh, in the Monday Night Wars and a winner between WCW and WWE, the underlying thing is it's his own money. Yeah. Compared to it being Turner's money. Uh, and Vince always seemed to me in the one year that I worked for him to be a guy that knew that and knew that it was because of his money that he had to make, I don't know if better decisions is right, but just kind of stay the course type decisions. Uh, and I think that's eventually why he won in the end. Because the buck stopped with Vince McMahon uh, with WCW. It didn't It uh, theoretically stopped with Eric Bischoff, but really it didn't. It stopped with all the dumbasses at TBS ahead of him. And there were plenty of them who put their uh, finger in the pie when they thought things were going well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I agree that uh, that Vince probably took the L uh, and then, de- well, he took the L and he got the big W, didn't he? He did. Yeah. It's, uh, it's worth mentioning here again because we're trying to be, you know, fair here. Uh, we th- are, huh? Th- th- well, it worked for what it was intended to do. I mean, WCW set a new gate record for themselves with over nine hundred thousand dollars for a nitro. Right. They mm-hmm. set a new merchandise record for around three hundred thousand, and they did win the ratings. They got a four point eight compared to the four point zero uh, for Raw, and, and their match, this Hogan Goldberg match, was the first quarter hour in the history of pro wrestling to reach five million homes, drawing an excess of 7 million total viewers for a 6.9 rating and an 11.8 share. And I'm curious, Tony, because these ratings would have been delayed a little bit because of the 4th yeah. of July holiday. Do you remember these coming in and how nervous was everybody when they finally come out? I don't remember them coming in, Conrad, because they weren't shared with everybody. Oh, I see. There, were, there was a big there was a big kind of kayfabe going on there. I, You know how I learned my ratings? I learned our ratings by reading uh, Entertainment Weekly. When they come on out with the top cable shows of the week, and we were up uh, on top there, uh, so that was not it was not like one of those things where the entire office is in on the thing. It's probably Eric Bischoff and members of the booking committee, and and that's about it. Right. It, wasn't, it was not shared with us. I always approached it like you got to do your job regardless of what the numbers are as best you can. And so to me, these ratings were great, and I knew what they were. But I didn't really, you know, I didn't really sit on the edge of my seat about them. It, uh, coming out of this show, it's reported that Goldberg was given a raise to four million over four years. Uh, so this has to be a record for someone only ten months in the business to get two raises uh, from whatever he started out at to now a four million dollar deal. Do you remember this raise being discussed? And, and hypothetically, do you think this would have been something he asked for or demanded, or is this just something Bischoff would have done on his own? I, I don't think that. Uh, I don't think. I don't remember it being discussed, but I think it's something that Eric would have done on his own. Yeah, yeah. I, I just knowing what, the the way Eric was, and you know, Eric really, and this is what made uh, his appearance on on Raw or whatever it was when the when the company folded. So mind-boggling. Eric, you know, for him, this battle was personal. Right. Uh, it was really, I mean, I remember, and fans, uh, guys in the, uh, guys in the backstage area may not remember this or even want to admit to it, but we were at the Target Center in Minnesota, and Eric uh, talked about how well things were going, and he may have discussed this, this night, uh, this night in, in the Omni or at the uh, Georgia Dome. Uh, and he said, and I remember him saying this directly, he said, I will not rest until I put a stake through the heart of Vince McMahon. Wow. So it was personal with him. And when I, I remember him saying that specifically because I remember where I was. And then when I saw him on Raw, I'm thinking, whoa, mm-hmm. how things have changed. But for him, it was very personal. So he probably, I would say that uh, he did that on his own. Maybe lost on all this is that this was the go home edition of Nitro for the Bash at the Beach pay per view six days later, and uh, all this means that there's a little bit of a change for the card again. Instead of a tag match with the Giant and Kevin Green, um, mm. you know, being involved with Kurt Henning and Goldberg, they switched that around, and so now it's Giant and Kevin Green working in a singles match, and it was better than most expected. And right. Goldberg defended his belt that night against Kurt Henning. And uh, Goldberg wore the belt to the ring that night 
uh, without the NWO spray paint that had been on the title for quite a uh-huh. while. Right. Um, it's worth mentioning around this time, and this is something that has kind of been urban legend, but it's been verified. Mark McGuire was arguably the biggest name in sports at the time, and he's a huge wrestling fan. He's on his way. This is, of course, the summer of 98. He's on his yeah. way to making history this season to break Roger Maris's home run record, and literally all eyes are on him. Uh, he's huge both in name and stature, and uh, he's also a big Goldberg fan and wanted to meet him. So Goldberg goes to batting practice before game and gets to hang out with McGuire. And Mark asks if he can rub the bat on Goldberg's chest and belt for good luck. And to the surprise of maybe no one, WCW doesn't have a camera there to capture it. Mm. Mark doesn't come to Nitro. Tony, as a sports fan, uh, who's someone who has seen how the celebrity influence can work for wrestling and the business, does it get any easier than this to to just set up a fucking camera? No, it doesn't. My question is, is... Who did McGuire go through? Did he go through Goldberg's people or did he go through WCW? In my head, he has to go through WCW, doesn't he? Yeah, one would think. And they, oh, don't, they don't send a camera depressed. for this. I'm getting depressed now. <laughs> you know you know why I'm getting depressed? Why is that? Well, it's, it's pretty apparent that in many ways we were a bigger fuck up than I thought we were. Well, that's what we're going to examine here on What Happened When? Mondays. Jesus. Uh, after Goldberg wins the world title, of course, he relinquishes the United States title. Uh, do you remember there being any discussion about maybe keeping Goldberg with both belts at the same time? No, I don't think so. I think they wanted to uh, make the U.S. title something separate, uh, give them their own champion, and move on from there. You know, you, you, you always have a chance with when you have the a U.S. champion and that is vacant, you have a chance now to do a tournament or try to do something different. Uh, so I know there was not, not that I'm aware of having to defend both titles in the same night. So I don't know what you've heard. No, I didn't, I didn't hear it, but I, yeah. if you're trying okay. to build the streak, you know, maybe there's an idea there, but ultimately yeah. it didn't happen coming yeah. off this win, uh, WCW would book Goldberg to work the house shows and he's working with Kurt quite a bit. And then eventually, uh, does the first ever meeting of Goldberg and the giant in a dark match, uh, and they're doing big business even on the West Coast here, which is historically WWF territory. Uh, but oddly enough, not too long after Goldberg is champ, by the end of July, you start to see some anti-Goldberg signs pop up in the crowd with things like Goldberg can't wrestle and so forth. Uh, and this is common in 2017 for a John Cena or a Roman Reigns, but somewhat unique here in 98 Tony, do you remember there being a backlash from fans where there was now a more vocal minority who who weren't with the Goldberg movement? Well, I think so. I, I think uh, the wrestling fan was starting to change around that time. Uh, you know, I can remember going back and being with the WWE back in 89, and it was very much a pro Hulk Hogan, pro babyface crowd. Uh, and even before then, with the ultimate uh, Rock and Roll Express babyface, uh, everybody cheering for him. I don't think in 2007 they would have cheered for the Rock and Roll Express. I think they would have booed them. Right. I think I think it was fashionable to boo people. Fashionable to try to become a heel fan, if right. you will, uh, if you will. Uh, and uh, so I I don't uh, I don't remember. I wasn't shocked by that at all. I just I mean fans became uh, a little bit more of the show. I, I guess they're even more so now with their signs and the way they reacted to everything. But, yeah, the, the fans changed to the point to where, Conrad, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to think who told me this. I think it was David Pender said uh, around that time. And he said it used to be that when we would, after the matches, go to the bars or after the matches go hang out, there were all these girls around. Uh, and... Now it's guys. So it went from being a very much of a uh, a groupy female type yeah. uh, audience to fanboys. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think the fans changed back then. It didn't shock me at all. I I could see that coming. Uh, later that it, July, Kevin Nash, Diamond Dallas Page, and Goldberg would all make an appearance at the opening of the famed Nitro Cafe in Las mm-hmm. Vegas. Uh, Mm -hmm. Tony, what was your favorite thing about the Nitro Cafe? Were you more of a Booker T, T T-Bone kind of guy, or are you more into the big, sexy porterhouse? 
Well, I, I really like the big, sexy porterhouse because when I ate one, I felt big, which I normally am, and I felt sexy. Uh, <laughs> and also, the, the also when I went to Las Vegas, I usually won a lot, won a lot at the craps table, so I was able to afford the big, sexy porterhouse. So you know, usually when you go to Vegas and you're in my shoes, you kind of just say, "Fuck it, I'll just spend the money." Anyway, so I was excited about a big, sexy porterhouse, uh, Conrad, because <laughs> that thing came all a cart. Uh, you, 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 you could order if you wanted to a David Penzer potato head, potato, baked potato, if you wanted, or you could order a, uh, Lord Stephen Regal French fry accessory. But normally the big sexy porterhouse, uh, just came by itself. And it was so big that I invited a bunch of fans to eat it with me. Well, that's, that's always nice when you share your meat with the fans. Yeah. I, I like to share my meat with the fans. Um, I know a lot. Of, I know a lot of the guys did too back in the eighties. <laughs> thank you for thank you for setting me up. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, WCW ran two domes in July '98. They finished on July 27th at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, which we know is where the Royal Rumble just was yesterday. Uh, and Goldberg was back there in July of '98 too, defeating Brian Adams on the show. Uh, and interestingly enough, and this is really fascinating to me. Now, let's bear in mind, he debuts September of 97. We're all the way in July of 98. This is where Goldberg does his first interview. That's just hard for me to imagine that he's been the champ for three weeks before he ever speaks. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm curious about the decision to book the domes here. Yeah. Uh, who was handling scouting of buildings and local promotions and just the building selection process for WCW in 98? I'm I'm thinking that was Zane Bresloff, who has since passed away, uh, who kind of did us on a national scale. We we also had Gary Juster, who who did that, and we had on locally Chip Burnham, and Chip just passed away recently too. But Zane Bresloff was was the guy who went out basically went out west and scouted those places for us. And Zane was kind of an independent contractor. I don't think he worked for WCW, but he did a lot of that stuff. A lot of the big shows, Zane Bresloff was involved in. Was there any concern with this first Goldberg interview that some of the mystique may be lost? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, you know, I really think that if I think there was a concern that because of his in-ring persona and because of the uh, the jackhammer was so great and because he had such a following and because he got so many big pops about his move, I think there was a concern that the interview would not live up to the man. Right. Uh, and. By that time, you know, by that time, I, I don't know if the promoters had enough of it, but I, as an announcer and, and as a fan, had had enough of guys screaming. Uh, the Road Warriors screamed. Scott Steiner screamed. Uh, everybody who was big and strong needed to scream. Uh, and I, I think they really wanted didn't want Goldberg to do that. So it, it, did somebody work with him on his interview? I don't know. I, I don't know if they did or not. But, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the term who's next obviously became, you know, a catchphrase. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, at the Road World, or I'm sorry, Road Wild 98 okay. pay-per-view, um, wow. it's not only difficult to uh, – yeah. It's not only difficult to pronounce, it's difficult to explain the idea yeah. here. I can't wait to talk about it in the future. But in this particular show, Goldberg participates in a battle royal, which is just crazy to me. Uh, he's the champ, and this is what our plans are for him. The battle royal is between the NWO red and black and the NWO black and white. Wow, the and, red and black. That was a great group, wasn't it? And somehow Goldberg. Yeah. But um, either yeah, way. I- you know what that is, Conrad? That's riding a horse till it breaks. That's all that is. <laughs> that is. That's, that's all it's doing. Uh, I, I'm sure we'll talk about the uh, Wolf Pack and this show later. But one thing I want to uh, drill down on is Goldberg black uh, backflip Scott Hall out at a minute 25. And then Kevin Nash, uh, who Meltzer writes, management was concerned about not even showing up until the day of the event. Uh, he is the only wrestler in the match that Goldberg didn't eliminate. And that's because he just simply walked out at a minute and 35 seconds to try to pound on Hall some. Uh, do you remember Kevin Nash being difficult to deal with as a talent here or any sort of concerns about him not showing up or refusing to let Goldberg eliminate him? 
I, I remember Kevin Nash, and, I, and I'm not so sure what what uh, during this time where Kevin Nash was involved. I remember Kevin Nash being involved in the booking committee. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he had a Kevin was always the type of guy who who pulled no punches. Uh, if he didn't like something, he would say it. Uh, if he liked something, he would say it. He and I kind of had a little disagreement because he thought that uh, he thought. Well, I remember we were in Reno, Nevada, and we went to we had a booking committee meeting, and it seemed like everything that we brought up, Kevin shot down. And I think he thought that I thought that he was being counterproductive to the booking meeting, and and he and I had a face to face about it and got everything cleared out. Because I was the type of guy that once you got in a booking meeting, if it went past twelve hours, I wanted to kill myself. Well, that's uh, that's okay. Uh, thing but to uh, I don't remember anything about Kevin Nash not showing up. Meltzer probably knows about it because probably you know somebody in Nash's camp or some wrestler who who knew Raz Nash. I don't. I can't say Nash called Meltzer, but somebody who you know the the whole thing is. Is back in the day, it's telephone, telegraph, or telewrestler. Yeah. And that's how you get the word out. Um, but I didn't know anything about him not showing up. I, I knew that there were a lot of things he was very upset about, and he made those clear in booking committee meetings. Now, when he was in that booking you know, committee, compared to this date at Road Wild in Sturgis in 1998, I don't know. So but that was near the end when he was in the booking committee. And, and we're going to talk about his influence as a booker coming up. Right. Uh, the next night after this road wild uh, catastrophe, yeah. Goldberg beats Ming and then was involved in an angle with Hogan and Nash, who were both using chairs. Uh, mm-hmm. And Nash gets a spear as the show goes off the air. So you start to see the seeds of a Nash Goldberg issue. Sure. Uh, the next week has Goldberg defending against the Giant in the main event, and it did great ratings, but. Uh, the finish was a DQ, and they started teasing Nash and Goldberg yet again. Uh, on the house show loop, Goldberg is still working with the Giant, and they're main eventing during this time. Uh, and the next week, kept that up again. This time on August 24th uh, edition of Nitro, it's Hogan and the Giant against Goldberg and Kevin Nash. And this did a huge 6.47 rating and a 10.7 share for nearly 5 million homes putting it in fourth place as the most watched television match in cable TV history. But of course it's another non finish. Tony, I'm curious, when did you know that Kevin Nash would be across the ring from Goldberg at Starcade 98? Because it feels like by the end of August, the seeds are already being planted. Well, yeah, it's pointing to that. I think we all knew that, that it was going to happen. I, th- I think uh, we, uh, not that I was told, but I think it's pretty apparent that we knew that that was the next opponent for for goldberg and why not nash was a big star it's worth mentioning here that uh Meltzer is reporting that this kevin nash goldberg collision is tentatively tentatively being considered for halloween havoc 98 and i wonder how all of this may have looked different had the match happened then but ultimately yeah. ultimately it didn't um, it comes out around this time, too, that uh, Goldberg has done an interview where he described himself as a mix between a UFC fighter, Bruiser Brody, uh, and an NFL defensive end. Um, okay, uh, I can understand the UFC fighter because yeah. he's tough. I can understand John Matuzak because he was a little bit, you know, nutty maybe. Right. But I don't know, Bruiser Brody, was that comparing himself to Bruiser because he did no shows or what? Maybe no sales. No, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm not so sure. I, I mean, I only know about Bruiser Brody basically from what I read. I never saw him. Right. So, uh, yeah. So here's a glimpse into the craziness that was WCW oh. in the fall of 98. This is one of my favorite stories we're going to cover. Oh my God. Uh, there's a pair of house shows in Indiana and they feature one advertised match and it's Goldberg versus the giant. Well, Bill had asked for these days off far in advance, and J.J. Dillon approved it. Well, no one told the promotions department, so they continued to hammer the market with these Goldberg ads. So now there's more than 7,000 tickets sold, and WCW does an announcement offering refunds. All but 1,800 fans opt to get the refunds. Only 1,800 actually wind up paying for the tickets. It's worth mentioning that when the WWE does this, where they offer refunds, uh, they announce a return date and then decide to honor those same tickets. So the company doesn't actually refund the money. They just issue a new set of tickets. 
Uh, but WCW had no return date announced, so everybody just got their money back. So WCW doesn't want this to happen two days in a row, so they panic. And they get Goldberg to drop all of his plans and fly to Indiana for the show the next day. And he was not too happy about that. Uh, he wasn't happy because then they had to immediately fly him to New York City for a on-sale ticket appearance at the Nassau Coliseum. This move cost WCW a private jet and a bill for $11,000, and this is after they refunded more than 5,000 tickets. Tony, do you remember this shit? How does this happen? Is this the inmates running the asylum or somebody just not caring enough to pay attention? It's the inmates running the asylum. Uh, J.J. Dillon was one of the most organized men ever. Right. Uh, And how this dropped through the, the cracks, cracks I'll never know. But, I mean, this is... To me, this encapsules what happened to WCW. There either were not enough people in key places that knew what the fuck they were doing, or the people who were in key places were fucking idiots. Uh, and I, I, I'm not pointing fingers at any one person here, but you know, people in, in regular companies will get fired for shit like this. Oh, absolutely. Wow. Wow. Well, I, there you go. Thank you for bringing my ass down. You're welcome. Uh, Anything else? At, at w- <laughs> bring me down about. Uh, we're, we're only to Fall Brawl. We're going all the Jesus way to Stark. Okay. Uh, at Fall Brawl, not only did Goldberg not defend the world title, he didn't even wrestle. Uh, instead, Chris Jericho beat a fake Bill Goldberg, where he did the famous parody of Goldberg. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tony, help me understand. He's the biggest guy you got on the squad. It's one of mm-hmm. your major pay per views. It's a trademark show, and your yeah. champ, your top guy, he's not even there. Yeah, maybe the same guys that booked this were the same guys that did the Indiana thing. You think? <laughs> I mean, it has to be, right? You know, Conrad, I hate shoveling shit on people that I work with and, and loved, but you're forcing my hand here. <laughs> They're going to listen to this podcast and say, boy, Shivani's really shoveling shit on the people who worked in wrestling. Well, it's here in black and white. It is. There's a lot of this shit that I didn't know about, and, and obviously, you know— Jericho was a talented kid, uh, funny, could work, and did the best he could when he beat his, uh, you know, his fake Goldberg. And I think he did a good job of that. But I agree, and I agreed back then. You know what the fuck? What the fuck are we doing? Yeah, that's what. That's what. That's what I'm getting. Telling you, this podcast should be named "What the Fuck." <laughs> Because that's all we're doing. We're going back and you're reading this shit to me, and I'm going, what the fuck are we doing? Well, you, I mean, we can see now why, you know, and it's no one person's fault, but we can see now why we lost the war. Right. And I'm sure they did some, I'm sure they did some fucked up things in the WWE, uh, too, but uh, wow. And hear about those fucked up things every Friday at noon, right here on MLW Radio, something to wrestle with, Bruce Pritchard. No, uh, really, yeah, speaking of fucked up people, how's Bruce doing? Well, as best he can. Yeah, I know. Tell him I love him. Okay. Uh, it, so that that may be, for some reason, what's going back in my mind there is a Goldberg. Uh, this may have been a trade off from Goldberg having to do that show. Oh, yeah, could be. Could be. For some reason, that, that, that uh, light goes on in my head about that. Yeah, uh, so so if you'll come do this house show in front of 4,000 yeah. people, we'll take right. you off the pay-per-view. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, of all the things that, that can hurt a wrestling promotion, no-shows may be the worst. Uh, Meltzer would agree. Yeah. No-shows, but regardless of giving a fan a refund, you put a bad taste in the mouth about how can we trust these people again? Right. How am I going to you know set aside my time with my family to come in, uh, five of us come, if we're not sure – that they're really going to come. Right. And uh, no shows hurt the Crockett's years ago. And as we can see, hurt WCW that hurt, even though they got a refund. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So DDP's win at fall brawl earns him the title shot against Goldberg at Halloween havoc. And that's kind of interesting because they're both baby faces, but the match would prove to be even more interesting, but we'll get there in a minute. Uh, on the September 14th edition of Nitro, Goldberg beat Sting with a lot of interference in the match with uh, Hogan and Brett being involved. Uh, again, though, it's another pay-per-view worthy match with huge names and it's on free TV. It seems like Sting and Goldberg could have been reserved. Uh, here's something that will really get us going in the ex- in the September 21st edition of The Observer. The latest rumors, and again, 
Any plans in wrestling more than 48 hours from now are subject to change, and long-term plans are almost definitely not going to happen like that. But anyway, the title is scheduled to go from Goldberg to Hogan to Nash, or from Goldberg to Nash if they can cut Hogan out of the equation. Although that may all be to keep Nash happy, because a happy Nash supplies a lot of good ideas. Was this the common mm-hmm. thinking in the back at the time that you need to pacify Nash? Mm. Uh, I think Nash garnered a lot of respect because he did have a lot of good ideas. I think uh, they tried to pacify a lot of people, right? And not only Nash. So I'm not. I don't think we could. It would be unfair to single out Nash to try to pacify him. I mean, they tried to pacify Hogan. They tried to keep Scott Hall happy. They tried to obviously keep Goldberg happy. Keep DDP happy. Uh, and you, you know, that's not easy to do. It's not easy to do Conrad when you're doing so much TV and you don't want to have a, a screw job finish to where no one gets hurt. Theoretically, no one does a job because all of a sudden your combinations are going together and the fans have seen everything. Someone's got to do a job. Someone's got to go down for the three count or, or whatever. And it's hard to pick someone to do that. So uh, I think that was a – I think this uh, not trying to keep Nash happy, they try to keep a lot of people happy within the, the framework of what they have, which was a lot of TV shows. L- let me say this. There's a lot of things that can be point to the downfall of WCW, and I don't know if this is going to – is for another show or not. But here's something else you can point to the downfall of WCW. Fucking WCW Thunder. Oh yeah, I want that show. That show should have never been ever on TV. And Eric Bischoff had a meeting with us, and he said, "I know there has been talk about us doing a show for TBS to try to uh, have TBS have the success we've had on TNT." He said, "And I've told them, then the TBS people, no, we can't do it. And unless Ted Turner himself comes down and says you're going to do it." We're not going to do that TV show. Well, apparently Ted Turner did come down and say you're going to do it because he ended up doing it. But that was also the start of the demise of what we had. That show should have never been on the air. We did not have the manpower to do that show. And I'm talking about uh, from a production standpoint, but mostly from a talent standpoint. Yeah, and Bischoff would credit that creation of that show with the talent raids that they did. He wouldn't call them raids with ECW and a lot of other areas, but we'll talk about thunder another time. Let's talk about an an anniversary here. You get me fired up here. I like it. I like it. Uh, the one year anniversary of Goldberg's debut, uh, you would think he would be on TV, but he did not appear on that, uh, September 20th edition of nitro because he didn't want to hurt the support he was getting from the Jewish community by having him wrestle on Rosh Hashanah. Do you remember that being a thing? No, not at all. I have no recollection of, of Goldberg's uh, religion uh, coming into play in the Jewish community at all. All right. Uh, Goldberg. That was not talked about amongst us announcers. Uh, Goldberg does some TV stuff here with Jericho, the fake Goldberg, Canyon, Lodi, Disco Inferno, Raven, and others. Just biding the time as they start to build towards the Halloween Havoc show with DDP. But the focus of that Halloween Havoc show is really Warrior Hogan, which I can't wait to discuss another day with you. But I want to circle back to Jericho. Uh, As we know, Goldberg nicks the plan of doing anything with Jericho after weeks of them building towards something of, you know, Jericho running him down, Jericho wearing the shirt, uh, even spearing him in the aisle. Lots of opportunities here where it seems like they're building to something but Jericho didn't want to lose in a quick squash, and Goldberg didn't want to sell for Jericho. Can you offer any insight on that, or is that all bullshit from Dave Meltzer? I don't know if it's uh, – Dave probably knows what he's talking about there. I can't offer any insight into it, insight because, I, I mean, it's happened historically. This guy didn't want to do that. This guy didn't want to do this. And I'm sure that uh, Goldberg was uh, pissed off about the uh, fake Goldberg thing. Right. Uh, so, uh, I don't know any insight into it, but Meltzer's probably right about that. It's worth mentioning here that wrestling is more mainstream than it has been in more than a decade at this point. Everyone from TV Guide and People Magazine to USA Today is doing stories on guys like Goldberg, Austin, and just wrestling in general. Uh, Nash and Goldberg even taped appearances on the Love Boat. Goldberg was invited on Regis. 
Uh, WCW was asked to appear at the New York Stock Exchange for a credit card partnership. Wow. Uh, and WCW started pushing stuff on QVC. So this is probably the height of WCW, right, Tony? Yeah, there's no question. We the WCW, uh, from the time I went back to WCW or went to WCW from the WWE in 1990, they uh, wanted very much to be part of the mainstream. Uh, even to back, I don't know if you remember this, Conrad, and I'm, I'm sure our fans remember, the old WCW Saturday night where they had Jim Ross interview somebody in the ring right. for the first hour, which was freaking brutal. Uh, but they would do anything at all to have some sort of crossover with some sort of celebrity. And now they're getting it even without even having to push it. Right. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, this was a height that WCW, to me, like, well, go ahead because I think what you're going to talk about next, if I'm right, is the height of WCW. Uh, well, let's talk about Halloween Havoc. DDP and Goldberg okay. are preparing for their match, uh, which is going to be the main event. And they're training for uh-huh. this match at the power plant, which you might expect with DDP, who had a reputation yeah. for wanting everything to be perfect. And their match would be pretty damned awesome. It won the best uh, match poll in the Observer's Poll for the Halloween Havoc show. And it was probably, I think you could make the argument, Goldberg's best match on pay-per-view. Uh, but that's not what the real story for this show was. This pay-per-view mm-hmm. famously went off the air as the Goldberg-DDP match was starting, causing massive backlash from fans who demanded refunds. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is maybe a pay-per-view snafu like we've never seen before or after. The main event folks paid to see just didn't air. Uh, so WCW had to issue refunds and just air the match the next night on Nitro. Uh, and, of course, that match broke every record ever, doing a 7.18. Uh, but the losses from the pay-per-view revenue were estimated to be between $1 and $2 million. Uh, and the Observer writes that the show went three hours and 22 minutes, but WCW made the decision to run long on the day of the show. So because it was so last minute, roughly 25% of the cable systems in the country weren't notified in time and just cut the feed after two hours and 55 minutes. So major markets like Time Warner in New York, TCI in L.A. and San Francisco, they all missed it. Uh, Fans weren't just mad at WCW. They were mad at cable systems because satellite fans saw the full show. Uh, So cable systems started offering the Tuesday replays for free. Uh, and rebates of ten dollars, twenty dollars, or even the entire twenty nine ninety five purchase price, and it's worth mentioning here because this is the most WCW story maybe in the history of WCW. This is not a legitimate sporting event that went into some sort of sudden death overtime that just ran long. This is a scripted show that knowingly went over the allotted time. So WCW created this problem. They didn't just fall into some bad luck here. Tony, what the fuck really happened with this? How is this possible? Uh, kind of right. This happens when they overthink their shit. Right. And they think that uh, we are going to try to do something different to try to bring the fans to Nitro. It also probably has a uh, – has an, uh, it, fuck. Man, I need a drink. <laughs> I started this day feeling pretty good about myself until I talked to your ass. Sorry about that. That's all right. Uh, To the point to where, now, if I remember this right, and if you're saying it right, we purposely went long on the pay-per-view. If I I remember this, so they would come back and watch it on Nitro. Well, that's the allegation. The WWF would start claiming that Eric Bischoff did this on purpose for ratings. And this caused viewers' choice to be very upset with him. So Eric rescinded his plan of having you give away the taped raw results that night and instead had you go on the air and say it wasn't a ratings ploy and that WCW was, in fact, the only company who really cared about the fans. So the match would air tonight for free in its entirety. And then you spent the rest of the show hyping the match, calling it the greatest world title match you'd ever seen, as if you were deaf, deaf, dumb, and blind for all Ric Flair title defenses. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, that's you do what you're told. <laughs> uh, I can't, I can't, I can't rationalize how that happened. I can only tell you this: that could be that the pressure of, I don't know, the pressure of uh, trying to get numbers for Nitro for TBS was so great 
that it superseded everything else. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, no, it does. And and I think that is, you know, the same thing we've talked about for most of this show, that ratings right. just ruled everything. Mm-hmm. Um so let's get to the November 9th Observer. Quote, everyone seems to expect Nash to win World War III and then face Goldberg at Starcade and end the streak. Aside from pacifying Nash, can anyone come up with one logical reason why that makes sense? Actually, based on advanced booking plans, Goldberg is still scheduled for title defenses after uh, Starcade, but the plans change every week. Yeah, well, you got to do that, right? Sure, I think you have yeah. to. Right. you gotta you got to schedule the world champion for title defenses after that event do you think uh everybody is just it's common knowledge nash is the guy who's going to end the streak by this point by the first week of nitro yeah i first think week so. of november i mean the streak's gonna eventually come to an end right yeah and that's the thing that i think a lot of people i oh, will get into it in a minute right. um let's talk about something that stirred up some stuff on the other end and that's in november the wwf filled in an offer for austin to appear in universal soldier 2 mm. and they turned it down without ever consulting austin saying the offer of fifty five thousand dollars was too low so the mm. production company pivoted and then offered the role to goldberg who accepted it uh, mm-hmm. eventually austin's air uh, austin's agent would share that detail with him and mention that goldberg was getting two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars mm-hmm. which caused austin to be furious with vince who tried to push off all the heat on the head of licensing for not discussing it with austin and this got to the point that vince had to write a handwritten apology um remind younger fans tony about the rivalry there was between these two guys as seemingly everyone in the mainstream media compared the two this even got to the point to where the wwf had stores in the mall like hot topic sell shirts that said austin sucks uh or austin rules goldberg sucks do you remember Mm -hmm. these two guys who never even really faced each other i mean i don't think they'd probably even met at this point everyone compared the two and it became, are you kind of a WWF guy or a WCW guy? And you hung your hat on one of these guys. Yeah. Because these were the faces of, of the front of the teams or the franchises or the companies. Uh, you know, you know, Austin was a tremendous worker, uh, but he was a hell of a talker too. that, uh, that stone cold Steve Austin gimmick was, I mean, made for him. Absolutely. And uh, he could, he could talk. And I think that's why he probably had an advantage over, over Goldberg in many ways because his his redneck rap, if I can use that term. Sure. Well, you're from was, Georgia. I'm from Alabama. We're cool with it. Damn right we are. Roll Tide. Go dogs. Where was I? So anyway, I, I think that the, that redneck uh, rap that he had was was really good. It really made him a big star, and Goldberg was a big star as well, and they both you know, were the faces of the franchise. And it was... Uh, when you thought about them, you thought about Steve, and you, you thought about us, you thought about Goldberg. Well, let me ask you this. This is what everybody really wants to know. Uh, okay. what, what was your favorite Universal Soldier? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. Uh, my favorite Universal Soldier was Allie Walker. Uh, she played in the first one. Uh, she also ended up playing in Longmire. She's uh, still pretty good looking at 55 years of age right now. So, Well, there you go. So go fuck yourself on that, that question. See you, see you next week where we talk about Tony Schiavone's favorite tits. Um, <laughs> random <laughs> fact here, Goldberg opened. Claude Van Damme. How about that? Claude Van Damme. <laughs> okay. Uh, around this time, Goldberg opens a 27,000 uh, square foot gym in Atlanta. Do you remember his gym opening up? Do not. <laughs> Uh, let's move As along. You can tell by looking at me, I didn't work out much. Well, I still don't. Uh, okay. Gold, Goldberg was programmed for segments with uh, Bam Bam Bigelow, who was a big signing from ECW at the time, and they spent a ton of time on him. This up, thinking he would be in a featured spot for World War Three, uh, but the Nitro ratings were so disastrous that none of those plans happened, uh, and all of that was scrapped. Uh, and the writing was on the wall here for the giant. He wanted to go north. He was not happy with the amount of money he was making. Uh, so they booked him to lose to Goldberg in about a minute and even had Goldberg kick out of the choke slam on the November 23rd edition of Nitro. Uh, around this same time, maybe one of the biggest things that happened in wrestling this year happened. Uh, TV Guide published copies of TV Guide with different wrestlers on the cover. Guys like Goldberg, guys like Austin. 
Uh, and they go on to sell the most copies since the death of Princess Diana. Now, I realize this sounds crazy in 2017, but it does huge business for TV Guide. And this is well before DVRs. So back then, nobody had an on-screen channel guide, really. This is the way you found out what was on television. And TV Guide had the biggest distribution of any magazine at the time. Uh, so, of course, since this is such a big accomplishment, the WWF champions this big on every television show, every chance they get. Uh, WCW mentions it zero times. Mm-hmm. Why, why is that? Because Austin was on one? No, because we, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. <laughs> That's why. I mean, Conrad, come on. It's, it's pretty obvious. Well, I just, it's nice if, to hear you say it. If you chronicle things, you know, there, there was a big disconnect between uh, between marketing, uh, booking, and television production. Big disconnect. I don't know why. I don't know if it comes back from the old kayfabe or if if there, there was just a big disconnect. I uh, – Years later, I offered to help out on that end, but that was kind of shit on too. So uh, there was just – there was a big-time lack of communication. And I guess you can group it as saying that we didn't know what the fuck we were doing, uh, and that could be part of it. But, I mean, that's another thing. You you take that thing and run with it, right? Absolutely. Let's talk yeah. about uh, – Maybe world- show it. Oh, for sure. You, you'd yeah. push it huge. I would. But yeah. what the fuck do I know? Yeah, well, we're – you know, I mean, we're – we're Monday morning. Yeah, armchair quarterback. Twenty years. Yeah, twenty years later, quarterbacks. I know. Uh, okay. Let's talk about World War Three and Nash winning. Uh, this is happening at a time when there's a lot of clicks backstage, and mm-hmm. Hogan has Eric's ear, but so does Nash. Mm-hmm. And supposedly, Hogan and Bischoff have a falling out when Bischoff decides to go with Nash as Booker, uh, and he books himself to win the Battle Royal and face Goldberg at Starcade. And now let's remember, as we talked about earlier, when Hogan agreed to put over Goldberg in July, the idea was Hogan would get a return match and be the first to beat him. Uh, But supposedly Bischoff makes this decision to move to Nash because Raw has just beaten Nitro handily a few weeks in a row, and Hogan was in the featured spot on those shows that lost. So Eric goes with his gut, thinks it's time for a change, and instead Hogan announces he's retiring on The Tonight Show. Um... Tony Nash becoming Booker, were you were you for it or against it? I know you mentioned he had a lot of good ideas, but did you think yeah. in the end it was the right call? Well, you know, at that time, sure. You you've got to change. You've got to have somebody come up with fresh ideas and do things differently. You you know, if if nothing else, because we were turning out so much television and so many pay per views, things got stale in a hurry. So you had to turn with somebody else. I would have been in favor of anybody being in charge of book of booking at that time so let's recap goldberg's pay-per-view run as champ here he wins uh the belt on july 6th that weekend his match is changed on pay-per-view it's no longer a tag match now he's facing kurt in a title defense he loses or you know he wins the match kurt loses uh we go to august we throw goldberg in a giant battle royal with the nwo he wins Mm -hmm. uh we go to september he's not on the show we go yeah. to October, his pay-per-view match main event starts, and the fucking thing goes off the air. Yeah. Uh, now we're in November for World War Three. You want to guess what he had going on there? Oh, go ahead. No Let's match. No match at all in November. Right. Uh, right. Instead, they do a contract signing on Nitro for Nash and Goldberg and say that Goldberg won't defend the belt before he faces Nash at Starcade. Bigelow continues his feud, constantly trying to attack Goldberg out of the ring, in the ring, backstage, outside, whatever. Uh, And it's worth mentioning that the shows here are maybe suffering creatively, which is what we're kind of having fun with. But somehow WCW is still setting records. On the 30th of November, they draw the third largest crowd and the all-time record for pro wrestling in the state of Texas, which turns out to be more than 31,000 fans paying more than $755,000 and another $257,000 in merchandise. Tony, when you see numbers like this, Despite all the bullshit we've talked about, Bischoff had to be feeling invincible at this point. Am I right? Yeah, he had to be feeling that uh, the sky was the limit for this company uh, because the numbers were, were proving that. But I think the uh, the disconnect or the, uh, uh, the the problems that we had backstage with communication and everything was, was starting to uh, move us downhill. 
By mid-December, Dave wrote, Everyone is noticing how rapidly Goldberg is cooling off. A few months back, his merchandise was huge, and now it's actually been nicknamed Coldberg. Can you remember a point where Goldberg's merchandise started to really cool off? I can't remember the actual merchandise, but I can tell you that the, the reason is was not Goldberg's fault. It's just the way we handled him or failed to handle him. Yeah, um, I mean, we just ran through the pay-per-views, and yeah, that's hard right, to argue. Right. I mean, let's circle into this. Uh, before we get uh, to Starcade, I want to mention something that is still just unbelievable to me. So we, we talked okay. about Maguire earlier. Well, Buff Bagwell comes out on Nitro around this time wearing a Maguire jersey and carrying a steroid bottle. Yeah. Um, Steiner asks, how many homers would you have hit without that? And Bagwell says five. So Scott tries to burn Mark McGuire's jersey, but it won't light, so he burns the hat instead. I get this is supposed to be cheap heat, but when this is one of the biggest sports stars in the world who gave you so much over the summer, why the fuck would you do this? Who, who allows horse shit like this to happen? You know, I, would, I can tell you that there would be a lot of times, not a lot of times, there would be some times that WCW would not know something like this was going to happen. Wow. That they would, they, these guys would just go out and do their own shit. Uh, now, if, if this was the case, I don't know. Uh, but sometimes you would see some some crazy shit that I, I know the guys doing the booking in the back had no idea they were going to do this. Uh, and Bagwell and Scott Steiner with the burning of the hat and everything may have been one of those times. Well, uh, to me, it sends a message to every other celebrity. Don't associate with these guys. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. Sure. Uh, So the middle of December, they're running house shows in Tulsa, uh, which is Goldberg's hometown, and he's working with the Giant, who's on his way out. Uh, Mm -hmm. Bill accidentally knocks himself silly on a turnbuckle and is legitimately hurt. He goes Mm -hmm. to the finish, but the matches for the rest of the house show loop just aren't the same. He's probably concussed, and if you've watched Monday Night Raw recently, you probably saw that. Uh, Mm -hmm. So we're finally here. We're 15 months in. We've got an undefeated streak of 173 and 0, a U.S. title reign, and nearly six months as world champ. It's time. Lots of folks debate this even today, but it's worth mentioning. Starcade '98 drew 16,066 fans, drawing 584,236 dollars and another 114 grand in merchandise. It's the largest gate for a WCW pay-per-view event in history, and the fourth largest ever for the company. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about Bischoff beating Ric Flair at Starcade another time. Uh, but let's focus on Goldberg for now. It may have made sense for Bigelow to be the one to interfere, considering that's what they'd been building to for weeks, or perhaps even Chris Jericho, considering that's what they'd been building to for months. But none of that happened. Instead, it was the Booker's buddy, Scott Hall, who used a taser gun on Goldberg, allowing Nash to hit Goldberg with a jackknife power go- power bomb and pin Goldberg for the very first time after about 11 minutes. And folks today are still critical of this, but if you watch the tape back, the live crowd exploded. Uh, the live reports from the show, though, say that after the show went off the air, all of this turned to booze. Mm-hmm. Tony, you were there. What yeah. really happened? W- w- was this... A success as far as the live crowd, or did they turn on it once it went off the air? I'm not so sure they turned on it once they went off the air. And I think the use of Scott Hall, now we can say the Booker's buddy, Scott Hall, but they were kind of tied at the hip as uh, the outsiders. Right. The outsiders, uh, Hall and Nash, Razor Ramon and Diesel. So I, I don't see that being a problem with him coming in with a taser. And the only way to beat this guy was to use something like that. Right. Uh, and, and again, the live crowd exploded after the show went off the air. This turned to booze. Now, are they booing look, the heels or are they booing the angle of him losing? See, that's the that's the kind of uh, thing there I'm not so sure of. Well, let me and, ask you this. Um, uh, whose idea was it to beat Goldberg? Was, was this Kevin Nash's? Uh, yes, I, 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 I don't know. Do you remember who pitched the cattle prod? No, I do not. Okay. Well, let's talk about the decision here because Nash has been criticized for this, and he's often said he wasn't booking at the time, but he was, right? From what I remember, he was. And he also says, and maybe this is accurate, um, if I was trying to put myself over, why would I lose the belt a week later with the finger poke of doom? Uh, Nash contends that this would allow Goldberg to look strong again, chasing for the title, 
which had been the formula that worked so well when the NWO was at its hottest with Sting. And since he had cooled off and this Kohlberg stuff had happened and you were piping in chants and maybe he didn't need to be the champ. Maybe he needed to be the guy chasing. Chasing. Do do you agree with that decision? I mean, in fairness, an undefeated streak isn't really the way wrestling works long time. I mean, how do you book your way out of that if it doesn't ever end? The guy just retires undefeated. It's unrealistic. Right. Well, well, to me, the old adage and and the the thing that always worked in wrestling was the baby face chasing the heel and the heel cheating and lying at every turn. And it was the chase uh, that got him back. And, you know, I don't think Goldberg uh, needed to win every match. And uh, in hindsight, this might have been a good decision to have him be the chaser. No, I, I I can't say that it was the wrong decision to get the belt off of him, uh, but I can say it's the right decision to put the belt on you. And you can do that at leatherbydan.com. You can actually get a What Happened When Monday special right now at leatherbydan.com. For only $9.99, you can get your very own custom championship belt. It's a three-plater. It's nickel. It's handcrafted right here in the States, and it can be exactly what you want. If you'd like your own version of the big gold belt like Goldberg lost here, you can do that maybe you want the old awa title you can do that maybe you want a custom championship belt that says what the fuck or a memorial to deborah mcmichael's breasts you can do that (laughs) and when you get a copy be sure to tweet a picture of it to tony shivani it's all he can think about and all you're going to be able to think about is how many possibilities there are for you to style and profile in a brand new belt from leatherbydan.com look for our logo right in the center you'll be glad you did 9.99 you can't beat this deal uh, now bobby heenan famously said um when he was on his way back to the hotel after the show he says he told today it's over they killed it wcw's dead the business is dead did you ever hear bobby say this and do you share the same opinion that this is really the start of the death of wcw goldberg losing yes no, uh, the start of de- WCW started to die before that. I would agree. I, yeah, I, I don't think it was this moment. And, and again, uh, in the, in the grand scheme of things, what uh, you know, what does one loss on a pay per view do? I mean, you go back and you take a look at this. All right, we had uh, sixteen thousand sixty six paying customers. Yeah. Okay. 16,666 paying customers. How many customers, how many people watch the Monday Nitro? A lot. A lot more than 16,000 homes, right? A lot. Yeah, a lot. So uh, we, we, I, I think we're putting too much emphasis or too much uh, stock into one pay-per-view match. Uh, and uh, no, there's no question. I mean, you've been, you've been going down the order that the death of WCW started long before that. And I, I, I think it's it, it may be unfair for for people listening here to think that we are chronicling or making uh, saying that Goldberg's run in WCW is what killed WCW, and that, that is not the case at all. Oh no, Let, let's be clear. They did huge yeah. business under Goldberg. All we're yes, talking about is how Goldberg rose, and then maybe how Goldberg fell. Because right. the way WCW booked Goldberg could have been done so much better. We just chronicled the pay per views. Mm-hmm. What a shit show that would be if that happened in 2017 with AJ Styles. You know, you look at the year he had last year as WWE champ. Uh, what if it looked like this? I mean, how right. would anybody expect him to be over? But yet, somehow, in spite of all that, Goldberg was such a dynamic personality and performer. That a dozen years removed from the ring, he's still back in the in the in the big time prime time WWE spots. Whether it's Survivor Series or it's Royal Rumble or it's WrestleMania, and he's doing this at fifty years old. It tells you what type of a performer he is, and it's worth mentioning that that year Goldberg would finish second in the Observer's Box Office Draw Award, and he's only second to Stone Cold Steve Austin. He would win the Rookie of the Year Award finished third in most charismatic fourth and most overrated fourth and least favorite and third in best gimmick. Uh, So to say Goldberg's first year was polarizing is an understatement, but it's never been done before or since as effectively. It has to be one of the most uh, impressive 15 month runs in the history of professional wrestling. Would you agree with that? No question. And there's no question that, uh, that Goldberg's uh, impact was profound. You mentioned he's 50 years old. Uh, and he's still out there performing, not on a regular basis like he did, 
but it's it. I had him on. I have a, uh, I have a during college football season. Uh, I have a uh, I co-host a radio show on Thursday nights, and we had Goldberg on our radio show, and we were talking. Of, this was right before uh, he had his uh, his his match against Lesnar, and uh, we talked about college football. Talked about the Georgia Bulldogs and everything, and he talked about, and I could just hear it in his voice how much of a, a competitor he was and the, the charisma that was Goldberg, you could hear that in that phone call. Now that, that may sound like another Tony Schiavone bullshit line, but it, it's really true. He had so much genuine charisma that he didn't have to talk. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I just think that, uh, I think when you, when it's, it's, it's all said and done, when you think of the success of WCW, I think of two things. I think of, Hulk Hogan coming aboard to put us in the mainstream, and I think of the the run of Bill Goldberg. Those are the two uh, things I think about most. And as we're going through this, it's pretty apparent to me that it may work a little bit better that you don't have any of the boys' book. Yeah, no doubt about that. And th- yeah. that's something we'll debate, I'm sure, in the future. But before we wrap this one up and talk about what we might talk about next week— what do you think will be Goldberg's legacy in WCW? We just covered the first 15 months. There's a lot more. We'll get there. Uh, but what will be his legacy in professional wrestling, at least in WCW? Uh, the one moment, I, I mean, the, the legacy is the, uh, the show at the, uh, at the Georgia Dome. Uh, the, uh, there, are, there are people who still talk about that today. I had, we had, uh, it was funny, I, I had uh, all five of my kids there that night and they had a bunch of friends with them. And as I'm walking out of the arena, some fans say, Hey, Shivani, you fucking suck. And my kids were like, Holy shit, dad, what are they saying to you? I said, that's just the way it is. Uh, but anyway, uh, Goldberg's legacy is that, uh, that in the face of all the crazy shit we were doing, he kind of legitimized, uh, what we were about. Uh, he, he made it. He made it seem real. Years ago, Conrad, when I was a wrestling fan, Magnum TA and I talked about this. You could look at wrestling, and you could look at a card, and you could go to an event at the Richmond Coliseum or Greensboro or wherever across the country, and you could say that guy's bullshit. That guy's yeah, his gimmicks bullshit. That's bullshit. But that motherfucker's real. And that's what Goldberg was. Everyone would say, you know. This is all bullshit, but that son of a bitch is real. And I, and I think that's that's his legacy in WCW. I wish that was the name of this week's episode. Goldberg, that motherfucker was real. But you <laughs> get to decide what next week's poll topic is going to be. Now, if you're not familiar with this concept, we've been doing it on our sister show, Something to Wrestle with, Bruce Pritchard, for quite a while now. You get to shape the show. We're going to put up a poll this week, and all you've got to do to participate in the poll is follow us on Twitter. It's at WHW Monday. That's at WHW Monday. And uh, we're going to put these poll topics up, and you get to vote for what we cover next Monday. Topic number one. NWO sold out. Tony Schiavone, this was just awful, awful shit. And we're right here at the 20th anniversary of it. What might we talk about if we talk about NWO sold out from 1997? I I, I, I don't know. I have to go back and watch it again. He blocks out all the painful memories, and that's how I, bad this I, was. I, I you you got to block out some of that shit, Conrad. You really do. Well, well you, gotta, you you, you got to remember the good times and the good things, and block out some of the shit. Well, and I blocked out most of the shit, but there's some, still some of the shit that I haven't blocked out thanks to you shoveling shit down my throat. I'm going to shovel a little more if topic number two wins, and this is yeah. when the Crockett's sell to Ted Turner. Uh, yeah. so, I, got, I got a lot of memories about that. A lot of memories about that. Uh, poll topic number three, Dusty mm-hmm. Rhodes from 1984 to 1985. Uh, you may famously remember Dusty Rhodes helped book Starcade 83, and that is exactly when Tony Schiavone started. So if you have more of a flavor for the old school and you want to hear more about the beginning stages of Dusty Rhodes and Tony Schiavone and Crockett, uh, go ahead and vote for poll topic number three, Dusty Rhodes 84-85. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, probably what's going to win, at least in my worldview, 
uh, Great American Bash 1986. Uh, this was the tour where they did all the big stadium shows. Some of it was awesome. Some of it was less than awesome. What worked, what didn't work. That's poll topic number four, Great American Bash 86. So let's recap. You can vote. All you've got to do is follow us on Twitter at WHW Monday. We're going to put the poll up today. Today is Monday when you're listening to this. The poll will be up today. We're going we're gonna to cut it off on Wednesday. So you've got all day Monday, you've got all day Tuesday, and Wednesday is going to be the finish for the poll. And your poll topics, again, number one, NWA sold out 1997. Number two, the Crockett sell to Ted Turner. Number three, Dusty Rhodes in 84 and 85. And number four, the Great American Bash 1986 Tour. Uh, but we couldn't do one of these if we didn't talk about how you could go ahead and put one of the fine T-shirts from Pro Wrestling Tees on your back. Tony, did you ever think you would have T-shirts in 2017? Uh, I didn't think I'd have it in 2017, uh, Conrad, but I thought maybe I would have it in like 1999 saying, <laughs> Shivani, you fucking suck. Uh, well, I, I disagree. I don't think Shivani fucking sucks. I don't think you will either. Go ahead and check out his pro wrestling tea store. Yes, sir. Some good stuff, man. There is some good stuff, especially if you are an old school fan. If you are, are if you really dig this kind of stuff, man, we've got something for you. We've got something that mimics the old Slamboree logo, which is kind of wow. funny. It says Shivani on it. Come on. Hard to beat that. We've yeah. got the old Thunder logo, because uh, Lord knows that's probably one of the worst things they ever did. Well, now we've got it saying Tony. Uh, yeah. you, can al- <laughs> you can also check out the official WHW Monday, What Happened When. It may or may not be inspired by Nitro. Uh, mm. And lots of other shirts. Just go on over to ProWrestlingTees.com. Look for Tony Schiavone. Just type in Tony or WHW, because Lord knows you can't spell fucking Schiavone. And uh, you'll see those shirts. Go ahead and support the show. That's the best way to do it. Uh, When we sell enough of these shirts, we can put the more crazy, silly ones, maybe with an ode to Deborah McMichael's breasts or whatever Tony's in the mood for. Now, let me say this about Deborah. I love Deborah. (laughs) Okay. And it wasn't just her breasts. She was a a fine lady. She really is. Sweet lady. I Um, love her. One of my favorites. I I also like Terry Boatwright, too. One of my... One of my favorites as well. I can't wait to talk about her. I'm a big fan. And I also of her. liked, uh, I also liked all the Nitro girls as well. Spice and Fire and. Um, Did you like Che, or was that really not your speed? Oh no! Oh yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot. I know somebody else we know really liked her too. Uh, any- yeah, well, yeah. Stacy Keebler loved her. Of course, she became the most famous one. Um. Yeah, we'll talk about the women sometimes. I can tell that you're excited about that. Women of WCW may be a topic on a future show. In the meantime, be sure to follow Tony. Tweet him. Give him some feedback. Tell him what you think. Uh, go ahead and hit him up at Tony Schiavone 24 I'm on Twitter at Hey Hey It's Conrad. And we'd love to have you follow our official show account. It's at WHW Monday. Maybe you've got a poll topic you'd like to suggest. Maybe you want to know more about Nitro Girl Che. Well, that's easy. Use the hashtag <laughs> what happened when. We're going to look in there, get some of your suggestions, and you can help decide what's on the poll next week. But don't forget our poll this week. Go vote today. It's already up by the time you're listening to this right now at WHW Monday. Uh, Tony, uh, how did we used to end Nitro back in the day? Well, Conrad, I, I, I'm not so sure what you're getting at, but I can tell you this. I'd like to hang around with you a little bit longer, but I'm desperately out of time. We got to go! Fire's got a chance!